recitation from the Holy Quran, so I'm going to request the team to please play that. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. قل هو الله أحد. Say, He is Allah, who is one. الله الصمد. Allah, the eternal refuge. لم يلد ولم يولد. He neither begets nor is born. Nor is there to him any equivalent. So, the Next Generation series is British Council's global research and engagement initiative. And ultimately, the aim is to get a deeper understanding of what young people are thinking, what they're feeling, what their perceptions are. We want to get a better sense of what they feel the challenges are and what they feel their opportunities are. And ultimately, we also try to identify concrete steps that we can take to help the next generation prosper and succeed. The findings of this particular report represent a combination of a rigorous and a thorough process, and I feel privileged to have been a part of this team. It's been a real labor of love, and as some of my colleagues will tell you, it's also been a challenge and a half working uh, with the issues that we worked with. Um, so on behalf of my team, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all here today. We have a full program, and so I don't want to take up too much time. And without any further ado, I would like to invite onto stage our country director, Amir Ramzan. Amir is an exceptional, accomplished leader with about 20 years of experience in all aspects of organizational leadership. He has served as a three-time country director for the British Council and has contributed to help grow multi-million pound English and exams operations in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia as well. Could we please have a huge round of applause for Amir? Thank you, Isa. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Guests, colleagues, and friends, I would also like to welcome you to the launch of Pakistan, the Next Generation Report 2023. Um, really pleased that you'll all be able to manage to get through the traffic and make it in today. I would like to give a special welcome to our chief guests. We have with us the Honorable Minister of State and Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on SDGs, Ms. Rumina Khurshid Alam, and we also have with us the Acting British High Commissioner, Andrew Dalglish. So thank you both very much for joining us today. And um, later on for the closing event, we will be joined by the Honorable Minister for Planning, Professor Ahsan Iqbal. So as, as I just described, the British Council Next Generation Program is a research series that seeks to understand youth attitudes, their views, their aspirations, with the aim to amplify the youth voice and to support policy making. Youth are at the heart of what the British Council does. As the UK's leading organization for education and cultural relations, we seek to build trust, understanding, and connections between the people of the UK and the countries we work in. And we do this through English, education, and arts with a very, very strong focus on youth. We seek to support youth get the skills, confidence, um, education that they need to reach their aspirations. We therefore believe it's very important to listen to and engage with young people as they will become the next generation of influencers, leaders, and shapers of their countries. This is all the more important in a country like Pakistan which has such a large young youth demographic. The British Council has conducted next generation research um, reports in over 20 countries. We've engaged over 48,000 youth and produced more than 21 reports. But I'm really pleased to announce and to share that the first ever next generation report, which was produced by the British Council, was here in Pakistan in 2009. And this report sparked a much needed debate 
on how Pakistan could transform itself to harness the potential of its young people. We then produced two more reports in 2013 and 2014 in Pakistan. So this, the 2023 report aimed to re aims to recognize and understand what's happened to youth voice and youth opinions over the past 10 years, what stayed the cha same, what's changed, um, and also seeks to understand what the impact of the pandemic has been on youth perceptions and, and, and their views. In addition to the pandemic, um, Pakistan unfortunately suffered from its worst ever floods in 2022, which as you all know, um, left 33 million people displaced and a third of the country underwater. And again, this impacted on the research findings and came through um, in terms of some of the things that the youth were saying. However, despite a 13-year gap from the first report in 2009, the 2023 report reflects many of the same challenges and frustrations for young Pakistanis. Economic problems, particularly around employment, remain a key concern, as does lack of political participation and an education system that does not meet the, needs of the, does not meet the needs of the youth. However, new challenges and opportunities have emerged, including climate change and the rise of social media, which are now shaping youth engagement and priorities in new ways. We are hopeful that this research report will benefit Pakistani policymakers, um, international partners, academia, civil society, and media, but most importantly, young people themselves. Um, we hope that this research will help shape the policy response in, 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 in correspondence to what the youth in Pakistan are saying. I would like to thank our research partners, Ipsos, um, for their fantastic, Ipsos Pakistan, for their fantastic efforts, um, despite the challenges faced, um, we face by the pandemic and the floods, and in completing this research in a timely manner. I would also like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Oscar Zaidi, Vice Chancellor of Government College Lahore, for helping us reach students from public universities from across Pakistan. And I would also like to make a special mention to our task force. Um, we assembled a task force of leading um, experts in their fields, influencers, to help and guide us through this process and to provide challenge where appropriate. And their contribution was invaluable, and we wouldn't have been able to produce this report without them. So a huge thanks to the task force. And finally, of course, I would like to thank my British Council team. I won't mention them by name because I will miss someone out and then get into trouble. But uh, you all know who you are, the non-formal education team, the research evaluation monitoring unit, and our communications teams, and everyone else who's been involved. Thank you for all your work on this. The British Council is committed to embedding the report findings in our programs and offers for young people. I look forward to the discussions today and hope that the report launched today will provide further insights and ideas to all of us gathered here to create an enabling environment for the young people of Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. Um, so young people are at the heart of what we do at the British Council and this research has given us quite an insight and while there are some challenges, we're also quite hopeful about the next steps and, and the future of the generation. Um, I'm very pleased to have the Charity Affairs at the British High Commissioner Andrew Dogley with us this morning as one of our chief guests um, and I'm pleased to invite him onto stage. Andrew is a seasoned diplomat with over 20 years of experience in the international affairs. He currently serves as the Deputy High Commissioner at the British, Council, British High Commission in Islamabad. Prior to his role, he was the deputy director of the Gibraltar EU negotiations in London, and he has served as his, Her Majesty's ambassador to Zagreb and Croatia. Um, could we please have a huge round of applause for Andrew to welcome to stage. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for the warm welcome, and thank you for having me here today uh, at this exciting event. Um, the Honourable Minister of State, um, dear country director, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, guests, 
particularly representatives of youth. Without you, this report wouldn't be necessary and it wouldn't have any meaning. Uh, your contribution has been absolutely outstanding, so thank you for that. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you at the launch of Pakistan, the Next Generation Research Report 2023. Why does this matter? Pakistan's population of 220 million is set to double by 2050. Now that is going to put an awful lot of strain on the existing stresses and fragile socio, so, social and economic infrastructure and basic services. According to the UN's medium projection, Pakistan's working age population, so if we're talking between the ages of 15 and 64, as a share of the total population will peak around 2050. That can sound quite frightening on the one hand. On the other hand, this change in demographic composition creates a once-in-a-lifetime window of opportunity to reap the benefits of a demographic dividend. With substantial multi-year economic growth being a possibility delivered by that demographic dividend, you should be seeing in Pakistan the same kinds of development and growth that we've seen in the wider Asia region. But we can't assume this will happen. We can't take it as a given. It needs to be stimulated by appropriate social and economic policies and programming. This covers a wide range of things, but in, in particular, I'm talking about family planning, girls' education, and women's empowerment. It requires an enabling environment with more and better jobs, better education and healthcare systems, and sound political, economic, and financial planning and institutions. I hope you'll agree with me when I say that the United Kingdom has long been a friend and partner to Pakistan. We share many cultural and historical ties, not least the large Pakistani diaspora in the UK. Every year, thousands of young Pakistanis make the decision to come and study in the UK, and many more take a UK qualification right here in Pakistan. Young people have a critical role to play in shaping the future of this country. And our role is to listen to what you have to say. We are therefore deeply engaged and invested in working together with you to find solutions to some of the issues that you and your contemporaries have raised in this report. The Next Generation Pakistan Research Report comprehensively examines the perceptions of the country's young population between the ages of 16 and 34 with a specific focus on their views, their values, beliefs, and actions. It assesses in detail the challenges which Pakistan's youth face today, how it impacts their choices and decisions, and the efforts those young people are undertaking to transform and to better their lives. Now, Amir Ramzan mentioned that the first report ever on uh, future generation, next generation, was done here in Pakistan in 2009. And it's really quite fascinating when you compare some of the results that have come out of the 2023 report compared to the 2009 report. Perhaps not surprisingly, some of the issues are constants. There are things that will remain uh, of concern to young people, economic problems being the primary one. Employment, will I be able to get a job? These are the key concerns that I think will remain true for any economy that is developing itself in the way that Pakistan's is. There's also a constant around political participation, or to put it in another way, political disengagement of young people in Pakistan. There are concerns about the education system. Does it meet what the young people of Pakistan need or require to address the challenges that they have ahead of them? And as Amir mentioned, newer issues have also been uncovered. 
concerns about the impact of climate change, I do not need to tell you, people of Pakistan, about the impact of climate change. You are suffering from it already. And the rise of social media, an opportunity, a threat, something that's there and something that needs to be worked with. The report provides invaluable insights which are going to need further analysis and which then should lead to an influence being exerted over policy makers and decision takers. So I would like to thank the British Council and their partners. I'd like to thank the youth representatives, those who responded, and the task force that Amir mentioned for putting together this much needed piece of research, which I hope will help the government help citizens and all key stakeholders in determining the way forward to harness that demographic dividend that Pakistan holds. Thank you very much for your attention and please do enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd like to now invite on stage uh, Ms. Rumina Khurshid Alam, our chief guest also for the, for the day. Um, Ms. Rumina Khurshid is a second time parliament member, member of the parliament of Pakistan and a reserved seat for the women from PMLN. She has vast experience in activating parliamentary caucuses and forums. She currently holds the position of special assistant to prime minister with the status of minister for state, convener, national parliamentary task force and sustainable development goals, and is also the acting president of the young parliamentary forum. She is a politician and an activist who is passionate about sustainable and inclusive development. Her diverse set of interests include international relations, climate change, minority rights, transgender issues, violence against women, and early child marriages. Can we please have a huge round of applause for Madam Marina? Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Very good morning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and very warm good morning to Honorable active, uh, Acting British High Commissioner, Mr. Andrew. Mr. Amir Ramzan, Country Director, British Council, respected guests and youth uh, representatives. I'm really delighted to join over here. In fact, it's a great pleasure for me and I'm honored uh, on this great launch uh, of the report, which includes, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the Next Generation Research Report 2023, which I think not only going to when uh, Mr. Amir Ramzan and uh, the uh, High Commissioner said in his uh, worthy remarks that it's going to lead towards for so many uh, unfolded areas uh, or it could be a great help for the policy makers so we would really like to work along and definitely those areas or those things which have been highlighted I think it will be great to work along with each other and to go into the depth of those as of course we all know uh, as of 2022 Pakistan is currently the sixth most uh, populous country globally with the two-third of uh, the population below the age of 30 making uh, <clears throat> sorry for my bad throat, making it among the world's youngest nation. The youth bulge is now uh, the dividing, driving force of these 20, uh, 200, uh, sorry, 2 to 20 plus million strong people. The government of Pakistan is aware and sensitive to uh, the needs of our young people. Our policy and programs have a central focus on youth development and engagement, as well as empowered service for youth at large. It is pertinent to mention that the government of Pakistan and the British Council are working together since 1948, a trusted and long-term partnership that aims to create stronger bilateral connections through education, arts and learning opportunities for young people in Pakistan. The Pakistan Next Generation report is a timely resource for all the stakeholders in Pakistan to use its finding in developing policy, programming, in addressing the multiple crises which Pakistan is facing now. The government of Pakistan is committed to the so socio-economic empowerment of our people. In this regard, the Prime Minister Youth Programme is our flagship initiative which aims to provide multiple opportunities to young people for their economic and social development. These initiatives include Prime Minister Youth Loan Scheme, 
laptop scheme skill and qualification through TevTech institutions. Engagement programs through HEC focusing on sports, climate, climate action, and career counseling on campuses. Our programs under the Planning Commission and SDG Secretariat complement the overall objectives of youth development. We have worked with the British Council uh, over the last decade and our key initiatives include the UK-Pakistan Education Gateway for the higher education sector support to the TevTech sector and collaborations across the country for connecting local schools in Pakistan and the UK are some brilliant examples. Ladies and gentlemen, as we become increasingly aware of the pandemic impact on our lives, we have also witnessed how the pandemic has exacerbated inclusion uh, and marginalization on our societies in 2022. Pakistan was hit by the worst ever flooding in the history of the country. One third uh, of the land was underwater and 33 million people were directly affected. This research gives us an insight into the thought process of young people and supports us to steer policy and practice accordingly towards that. Despite a 13 years gap, the 20, uh, 2023 report reflects many of the same challenges and frustrations for young Pakistanis are reported in 2009 as well. Economic problems, particularly around employment, remain a key concern, as does as lack of political participation, as my already two of the participants already, uh, speakers have mentioned already in it, and an education system that does not meet the needs to the youth. However, new areas of challenges and opportunities have emerged, including climate change and the rise of social media, which are now shaping youth engagements and priorities in a new direction. These are valuable insights that further analysis, analysis to influence policy making and implementation in an empowered manner. We look forward to engaging further with British Council and stakeholders present here in this room to provide advice and technical support in addressing these big challenges faced by our young people. In the end, I would like to thank British Council and their partners to the youth respondents and the task force for putting together this much needed piece of research, which will help the government, citizens, and all the key stakeholders in determining the way forward to the harness of demographic dividend Pakistan today. In last, I just wanted to say one thing else, that no matter, education shapes a person, but I believe when we talk about the skill-based education, that refines you, that gives you the way and leads you towards success. Wish you all the great, blessed day. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, madam, and thank you so much for your commitment to providing more and more opportunities for young people. Right, so seeing as this report is about young people, we thought it was absolutely necessary to actually hear from young people directly, and so I'm very pleased to introduce the next panel um, for today, the first panel for today, actually. And to chair this panel, I'd like to call on stage Nadia Qasim. So Nadia has a master's in education planning and management and more than 17 years of experience in project management, education, youth and teacher training programs. She has been extensively involved in designing and developing training materials, project implementation plans, budgeting, monitoring, evaluation reports and proposal writing. Um, Nadia, could we have you on stage please and can we have a huge round of applause for her? I know we can muster more energy, I can't hear anyone in the back, can we hear a louder round of applause please? I think it's time to wake up a little bit. One more time, can we have a huge round of applause for Nadia? That was much better, over to you. Thank you so much, Iza, and I'm also representing youth. Um, as we know, uh, two third of Pakistan's population is under uh, 30 years of age. So we can say that youth is the driving force of 220 million strong people. So it's important to know their aspiration, uh, the challenges they face, and what are the platforms and pathways that can be provided to them so they can play an effective role in the economy of Pakistan and different spheres of life. So I would call my uh, panelists on stage. So the first uh, guest is uh, Ms. Hafsa Kader. She is member of the Welfare Association for New Generation. She is also the leader of Adolescent Development Initiative, 
that aims to address young girls health concerns and uh, raise awareness on reproductive rights she also runs a popular podcast campus kahani that provides a platform for young girls to share their stories ms hafsa kader please come on stage and take your seat our second panelist is ms rutaba tarik she is she is a double gold medalist and has attended sos academic summer school on ambassador scholarship to study conflict uh, and international development she is the vice president for the asian african youth government and project coordinator country coordinator for the islamic conference youth forum and has been involved in oic's first youth policy thank you rutaba our next panelist is uh, ms ikra zaheen who is not only studying climate change but also working for uh, its awareness uh, she is the climate change and the winner of uh, cop 26 uh, fund of british council uh, for her project on biogas plant installation for producing environment friendly uh, biogas she has also won experimentation innovation challenge award for young women in energy 2022 by undp now i would like to call uh, our next panelist mr joshua dilawar who is a young activist and also member of prime minister prime minister's youth uh, national youth council and uh, strategic advocacy committee he has received he has received the youth and leadership award from bill and melinda gates institute and speaks champions award from uh, civicus pakistan's prime minister youth excellence award our last panelist mohammad ali mohammad ali is a founder uh, member Uh, uh, of we work that works to empower young uh, people uh, for innovation and entrepreneurship mr ali thank you for joining thank you once again okay uh, so uh, we will start directly with the question because we already then so uh, hafza uh, hafza my first question would be to uh, women in pakistan are still considered marginalized and they are given very limited uh, you know opportunities to education sports employment and specifically in decision making so uh, what do you think that how can what platforms or pathways that we can provide specifically to young girls to fill this gap thank you so much uh, nadia having me on board uh, the girls in pakistan the females in pakistan are actually really vulnerable Uh, even uh, in Las Vela, I'm from a village, and I have observed that uh, how much vulnerable a female is in every sector, especially uh, in that pandemic when I was in ground. I personally observed that uh, the situation is really bad. And जो आपने question किया कि किस तरह हम females को कौन कौन से वो platforms दे सकते हैं कि वो आगे बढ़ें तो इसमें काफ़ी सारी चीज़ें आ जाती हैं जिसमें सबसे पहले तो है कि उनकी एजुकेशन उनकी हेल्थ एंड देन उन्हें एक प्लेटफॉर्म दिया जाए टू रिप्रेजेंट देयर सेल्फ्स मैंने यूनिवर्सिटी में ये ऑब्जर्व किया कि द गर्ल्स आर नॉट कॉन्फिडेंट एट ऑल क्योंकि लसपेला यूनिवर्सिटी जहाँ लोकेटेड है 
वो जगह मोस्टली रूरल एरियाज को कवर करती है एंड गर्ल्स इनरोल्ड इन दसपेला यूनिवर्सिटी आर मोस्टली फ्राम द रूरल एरियाज तो दे आर नॉट एबल टू स्पीक अप इवन इन फ्रंट ऑफ गर्ल्स सो टू कवर दैट गैप आई लॉन्च अ पॉडकास्ट दैम कैंपस कहानी टू मेक दैम स्पीक इट्स ऑडियो पॉडकास्ट जस्ट वॉन्ट दैम टू स्पीक देयर स्टोरीज देयर प्रॉब्लम्स एंड द गर्ल्स आर रियली डूइंग दैट सो आई थिंक वी जस्ट नीड टू गिव दैम प्लेटफॉर्म्स उन्हें एक जगह दें उनकी पहले तो एजुकेशन दैन उनकी सेहत और फिर उन्हें एक जगह दें जहाँ वो बोल सकें कुछ कर सकें उन्हें स्किल्स प्रोवाइड करें थैंक यू हिफा सो मूविंग फॉरवर्ड टू रताबा हाउ डू यू थिंक पब्लिक प्राइवेट पार्टनरशिप कैन वर्क टुगेदर टू प्रोवाइड अपॉर्चुनिटीज फॉर यूथ स्किल डेवलपमेंट सो दे कैन कंट्रीब्यूट टू द सस्टेनेबल इकोनॉमी ऑफ पाकिस्तान Trips can go a long way when it comes to, uh, you know, addressing some of the mainstream challenges, especially around uh, the the current economic crisis. And the public sector has a huge buy-in over here and an interest. If they train young people, which is essentially the labor of tomorrow and the labor of today, there are dividends in the long term for them over here, right? So we need to work towards identifying the public sector interests and also the human development interests that the uh, sorry the private sector's interests. and also the human development interest that the public sector has and merge those together uh, unfortunately for example i come from karachi and uh, within the sit youth policy there are no specific mention of public private partnerships mm-hmm. right uh, however the department could actually use the financing that can come from the public sector right um, similarly mainstreaming youth challenges into csrs for example the corporate social responsibilities that uh, companies identify can go a long way so when specifically like organization and grassroots mo- movements like myself when we're working on empowering young people on civic engagement political engagement when we go to organizations they are like huh what are you working on why are you going to fund anything of that sort but we tell them there are soft skills that people need to learn through debate and negotiation and mediation that are going to make them useful managers in your companies in the long run they're not just going to be your clerks and they're not going to yeah. uh, spend their time 10 years thinking how they're going to make leaders of tomorrow so you need to think uh, actively around those so i think the policy framework is there within all provincial levels um the private sector needs to wake up uh, and look a little bit around the what the policy frameworks are around you and identify areas that they can invest in and and see that there's going to be a dividend if they train young people as quality labels if they engage with universities for instance to identify where the skill gap is um and and communicate with them so that ac- academia could work on developing curriculum and training programs so when the students graduate mm. you know they have fair understanding of the market that they're entering i graduated from a state university it took me the longest time to understand what my place was in the market and that was yeah. only because in the university where i was where i was getting a knowledge i was not getting an understanding of the market realities so i think public private partnerships on education on skill building and labor uh, improvement of the labor quality could go a long way Yeah, thank you, Rutaba. So, Rutaba talked about public-private uh, partnership, and I think they both have a, a very major role to play uh, uh, in, in this field. So, my uh, next question, uh, Ikra, uh, to you is that you are already studying climate change, so it's it's something new uh, for all of us. Uh, climate change. So, how do you think that it is affecting youth? Uh, first of all uh, i am thankful to you uh, for inviting me uh, as a panelist and uh, uh, good morning and assalam alaikum to all the uh, members present in this hall uh, obviously uh, climate change is affecting the youth of pakistan uh, in various ways if we talk about uh, uh, there are is a uh, health issues uh, that are also uh, produced uh, in youth uh, is all of cause of climate change and uh, the livelihood of the our country is also uh, disturbed by climate change and uh, food security and uh, gender based violence that is also created by the climate change if i uh, talk about the livelihood as uh, our country pakistan is an agriculture country and uh, 65 to 70% of population depends on agriculture sector and uh, the farmers and uh, uh, the uh, workers and the women that are working in agriculture they all are youth and they are facing due to the uh, global warming climate change uh, temperature increases and we are facing uh, with water loss and uh, pro- our crop uh, production is also lost due to the climate change and increase in temperature and we didn't 
fulfill the desire of our uh, country. So we have to uh, import uh, wheat and other policies from other countries. So uh, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, climate change is affecting uh, in every sector of, uh, uh, in every sector uh, while uh, youth is engaged. Thank you. And uh, Ikra, my second uh, part of the question would be that how can youth play their role in raising awareness to contribute, you know, at uh, <coughs> policy level? Yes, uh, more, uh, if I talk about policy making, <coughs> that, uh, in Punjab in 2012 uh, policy making starts and uh, in Sindh it will be start in 2016 and in Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa it will be start in 2020-20 and uh, in my opinion policies are always made by the youth and uh, w uh, not even made by but uh, we can follow and implement it by the youth. If I talk about the leadership, most of the uh, development uh, sector are uh, working on the leadership and lots of the uh, projects that are run by the, uh, by the youth leaders. And uh, if I uh, secondly, uh, all the businesses and uh, entrepreneurship ideas and startups, they all are the uh, innovation of young leaders. And as well as uh, if we uh, talk about education, uh, the, all the doctors, engineers, researchers, and PhDs, they all are the youth leaders. And uh, opportunities are open for all the uh, youth forums in every sector. But uh, the problem that uh, comes here, uh, we did not. Uh, uh, youth could not uh, know how to grab the opportunity. Mm. Our, uh, due to the illiteracy rate, our education system and uh, we uh, didn't uh, uh, show the students how they can uh, collaborate with the organization sector. Like uh, British Council uh, uh, plays its a vital role uh, while uh, giving the training of active citizen uh, in different universities. And here I want also mention uh, the gym clubs. Uh, that is the innovation of um, uh, government of Pakistan and uh, HEC and uh, the, from the British Council. Uh, in gym clubs, we have that is the platform for the youth. They can uh, join their uh, hands with Muslim hand and government and HEC and uh, play their uh, role in uh, betterment of their country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ikra. Uh, now we'll uh, move forward with our next question that is about inclusion. So we talked about that we need to include women and you know young uh, people. <laughs> So how do you think uh, inclusion and equality be mainstream in policy and practice for youth? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, good morning, namaste, satsriya uh, kaal. First of all, uh, uh, congratulations to British Council and all the partner organizations for successful uh, launching the report. I think it's quite important and you know having a huge number of young people in Pakistan and currently having a huge number of young people in this hall, it's quite great. If you are young, please make some noise. Guys, are you young? By heart and by age, you all can make noise. <laughs> Even I'm <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, coming back to question, I think it's quite great and uh, I think fortunately that uh, I will share an example being a part of National Youth Council by the Prime Minister and uh, fortunately or unfortunately I'm the only non-Muslim in the whole National Youth Council. I feel that it's a b big responsibility to me, not in a bad, a bad term. So uh, it's quite a great initiative by the government to be, uh, you know, to engage the young people and young voices at the policy level and to meet uh, with the policy makers because it's, it's not common in Pakistan. If you are thinking to meet a minister, if you're, you know, thinking to meet a senator, you will just, you know, drop the idea that you cannot do that and you cannot visit the prime minister office. So I'm, Lahore, I'm from Lahore, I'm Joshua and I'm from a very small town and uh, like since three years, I've been visiting Prime Minister office, I met Prime Minister, I met the President of Pakistan. So if I can, anyone can, I think, right? It's quite important. And if you talk about inclusivity and, uh, you know, uh, gender equality, focusing uh, policies and all that. So I think that, uh, yes, it's quite important because unfortunately policies are being uh, made in Pakistan like if you are if you are making a uh, policy for women without women if you're making a policy for youth without youth so I believe that there is nothing for us without us so we have to engage young people at the policy level policies should be in, uh, inclusive and uh, focusing equality or from all the gender from all the race and from all the color like regardless of color and gender and all that so along with that I would also say that it's not just at uh, it shouldn't all shouldn't 
not just focusing at the policy at the government level, but all the civil society organization, they should also, you know, make their policies, their time, their organization inclusive and accessible for all. Last year, I initiated a project for the very first time in Pakistan, focusing the deaf community and their uh, health and well-being. And I came to know that they feel that they, their existence doesn't matter to the, uh, the society. So this is what we, are, we have to come and we have to you know, make them realize that their voice does matter. Even if they cannot speak, it doesn't mean their voice is unheard. So I believe that uh, we have to make the policy at the government level, at the civil society level. And uh, this, this thing, I think, has three wheels. First, we have to enable young people. We have to you know, uh, enable them to get proper awareness and education that their existence does matter. Their voices at the policy level does matter. Speak up for your right, and uh, no one will give you anything in the plate. So you have to, you know, stand up. You have to raise your voice. You have to, you yes. know, make a government accountable. So you are the one. And second thing, should government should, you know, mm. give importance to uh, young people, not just to fill the spaces, not just to fill the chairs, but their meaningful youth participation is quite important. I will emphasize on meaningful youth participation, not just yes, youth participation. Th thank, thank you, Joshua. So moving to Ali. You are extensively working with young people. So uh, I would ask you that what are the most, uh, or you can say the top three demands uh, uh, young people of Pakistan ask for? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Nadia and British Council for arranging this event and inviting me. Uh, since we know that uh, it's a huge chunk of our population that's from youth, so the list of aspirations and demands goes long. Uh, but the major areas where people the young people say that they need opportunities, that's in education, health, sports, uh, tourism particularly, and uh, new job opportunities. And when I say job opportunities, they are more into new market spaces. Uh, so uh, like for example, in education, they focus on that the course content or uh, uh, the outlines, the course that has been taught into the educational institute that must be in line with the changing trends that is globally. So we need that reform and the youth is asking for that. Uh, since it has been already shared in the opening note that it's the time where social media is playing an important role. So people, young people have awareness about that, that what actually is happening abroad. So they ask for that. Uh, similarly, if we talk about the new market spaces, uh, tourism is something where people can come in, young people can come in, they can uh, start their new businesses in the hospitality industry or something. So they ask for those opportunities as well. Uh, similarly, health is very important uh, and we see that uh, uh, fortunately, I would say unfortunately, we have uh, challenges towards the reproductive health rights in Pakistan and youth ask for that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, we wish we had uh, you know, enough time to discuss all these uh, recommendations, but thank you all for your recommendation and your suggestions. Uh, and they are really, uh, I would say they are uh, valuable. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nadia, and thank you so much to our, our young panelists. Can we please have a huge round of applause for them? I love their energy, I love their commitment, I love that they're working towards the betterment of our country. Right, so on that note, I think we are now going to officially launch the Next Generation Pakistan Report. So I would like to call um, Amir and Madam Romina and our Youth Task Force um, right in front of our Next Generation hashtag, if you please. Um, can I also have Dr. Mariam Rabb, Vajaya Irfan, and Sadia Rahman in the center? Right here. Can we have the youth task force members on stage, Shahid? <laughs> so, if you look a little bit to the left, there is a there is a launch button. Without any further ado, I request our chief guests, 
to please launch the report. Can we please have a round of applause for that too? It's very exciting.
long work summarized in a three-minute video for all of you, and it probably feels like an onslaught of information. So what we're going to do next is I would like to invite on stage one of the masterminds of this research report, um, Usman Zafar. And what he's going to do is he's going to walk us through the findings. Um, and at the end, I think we'll give you a couple of minutes of questions and answers. So if you have any questions, note them down, and then we'll, we'll take them in the end. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Usman Zafar, who is a strategic communications and research expert with over a decade of experience in social behavior, change communication, and evidence-based learning. He's a graduate of SOAS University of London, and he's worked on research campaigns, digital engagement, media strategy for several national and international organizations, including the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, FCDO, USIP, NADRA, and the European Union. His, work, uh, his areas of work include peace building, violent extremism, youth engagement, and online disinformation. Can we please have a clicker for Usman? And also, can we have a huge round of Usman for Usman and then welcome him to stage? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Iza, for uh, the wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to um, represent uh, the very, very important and critical work that we've done on the Next Generation Report. It's been the result of months and months of labor and really, really in intensive intellectual and research-driven work. And it's my absolute pleasure um, to, to present this study and my gratitude goes to the wonderful team at British Council as well as our excellent team at Ipsos for having presented the results that uh, I will be sharing for you over here. I will very briefly go over the overview of the study, uh, what are the key factors we are going to be focusing on, and what are the important insights from this study that we can understand about how young people perceive their uh, challenges, aspirations, hopes, and fears in Pakistan. So very briefly, as you saw in the video, uh, we have gone for a multifaceted approach to developing this research study. We started with an extensive literature review looking at um, dozens and dozens of research reports, studies, policy papers uh, relevant to Pakistan on youth engagement. Uh, we also conducted key informant interviews with several experts uh, in the fields of youth engagement, disability, um, human rights, education, employment, to understand exactly what the challenges are of young people currently at present. And then we conducted a further four ideation groups uh, with young people from different areas to kind of understand what are the areas of inquiry that we need to be going towards. We took that towards the qualitative research model whereby we conducted 17 focus groups with over 200 respondents all over the country. Uh, we made sure to represent all provinces and regions in it as well as a substantial gender ratio of 50-50 for young people between the ages of 16 and 34. We took the results from the qualitative research and we used those to build the battery of statements and questions that we would then take to the next level of inquiry, which is the quantitative survey. The quantitative survey was a nationally representative exercise whereby we conducted interviews with three and a half thousand respondents, young people between the ages of 16 and 34, from all regions, from all walks of life, making sure that we went for a stratified random sampling to ensure that we would have a completely representative perception of young people. Uh, we went, as with the qualitative, on a gender ratio of 50 to 50, a substantial uh, rural-urban ratio as well. Um, and we made sure to include all people from all socioeconomic areas as well. In addition to that, to ensure that we would also have the perception of people from marginalized communities, we established special quotas for persons with uh, disability, transgender community, religious uh, and ethnic minorities, and so on and so forth. The results from those survey were then put through a really important distillation process whereby we involved a lot of intellectual capital utilizing the expertise of the youth task force as was mentioned over here, as well as um, key informant interviews that we conducted to really uh, crystallize the key findings which we will be presenting in today's presentation. So you might have seen this aspect in the video as well. I just thought I would very briefly walk you through the trajectory of how exactly we approach the study. Whenever you talk about the issues that young people face, there are several issues that come about. But it's not just important to catalog all of them. 
it's also critical for us to contextualize them, to understand how one factor affects the other factor. And so we developed a unique analytical framework to put all of these findings in context, which we are calling the 4E model. We believe that youth trajectory goes through four distinct phases. The first phase of inquiry involves assessing the external factors that are influencing young people, which we refer to as E1 environment. These different pressures and factors prioritize the needs of young people towards their emerging challenges, which are E2. These are the key areas of focus that young people think are the key priorities for them. Based on all of these pressures and externalities, young people aren't just bearing it and facing it, they're reacting to it, they're responding to it, they're being influenced by it, and they're changing because of it. That takes us to E3 effects. And because of these changes, both good and bad, we're seeing young people's trajectory go in a positive direction or in a negative direction. Now it would be superficial of us to assume that young people are simply going to be making these changes on their own. At the end of the day, there are key groups, individuals and institutions that have a critical role to play in this process, whether young people are going to go forwards or backwards, which takes us to E4 enablers. Based on this analytical framework, we have contextualized the findings which we're going to be presenting here today. And we hope that these insights will be incredibly important for policymakers, civil society organizations, think tanks, research uh, groups, as well as advocacy institutes for young people. The first aspect we need to understand is what is the mindset of young people? How exactly do they perceive themselves and the world around them? The first aspect that we thought was of interest was that when it comes to issues of identity, there appears to be a bit of a division on it. 47% of people say that I identify myself on the basis of my religion first, whether it's Muslim, Christian, Hindu. 44% prioritize themselves as Pakistanis. They prefer to identify themselves as that. And I'll show you later on why that's very, very important. Contrary to popular opinion that young people are just desperate to leave the country, our research actually shows the opposite. Two-thirds of them actually want to stay in Pakistan. Only one-third want to move abroad. They are very optimistic about the future of Pakistan. They're optimistic about their careers. They're optimistic about their prospects. Seven in 10 are positive about the future of Pakistan, their lives and careers. But at the same time, there's a keen sense of frustration and inability to really move ahead. And four in 10, because of that, say they lack power over their direction, where exactly they're going to be heading. And one possible reason for that is a sense of disenfranchisement with the political system. Three in five young Pakistanis feel they have little to no trust in the political system, which is why only 10% of young people have voted in the last 12 months, despite a flurry of political activity that we have seen. Going back to the identity factor, we thought this was an interesting statistic to look at. We did a comparative analysis of the 2009 next-gen study, the 2013 next-gen study, and the 2022 one. And if you see the figures over here, Pakistanis identifying themselves as religious first is actually dropping from 75% in 2009 to 47% in 2022. On the other hand, young people identifying themselves as Pakistani first, emphasizing their national identity over their religious one, has actually increased from 14%, almost tripling to 44% and being at par. The next stage we'll look to is E1, which is environment. What are the various factors that are affecting youth and pressurizing them in different ways? Based on our research, we identified five key areas of inquiry. Economy, social vulnerabilities, social and political divisions, family and generation gap, and climate change. Looking at these external variables in total, you can see the amount of pressure the kinds of external factors that are really coming down on youth in different ways. When we look at family and generation gap, our research showed that in many cases, whether it's lifestyle, 
whether it's career choices, whether it's their outlook on the world, there is a difference of view between how young people see their prospects and how parents see their prospects. And because of that, there's a tremendous amount of pressure that is taking place within the household for young people to conform to decisions and lifestyles that may not be of their own choosing. On social vulnerabilities, three in five Pakistanis, young Pakistanis said that discrimination exists on the basis of gender, on the basis of disability, and against the transgender community. On social divisions, we saw a lot of split on whether young people really feel that there is polarization in society or not. Two and three said society acts biased on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of religious beliefs, and on the basis of political beliefs. Economy was particularly important, as was mentioned previously. Unemployment and poverty are considered the most important issues for young people, which is why nine in 10 Pakistanis believe it will be a key voting issue that will decide who they're going to elect in the next polls. Lastly, on climate change, as was mentioned uh, by the special assistant as well, the floods have been incredibly devastating for a variety of reasons, whether it be through displacement, whether it be through uh, the destruction as well uh, due to climate change. The important thing to understand over here is that young people are becoming increasingly sensitized to the impact of climate change. This was something that we have not seen in previous studies. We saw high sensitization towards climate change affecting their lives. Seven in 10 young people are concerned with this impact and eight in 10 consider climate change as a key factor that will influence who their next vote goes to. Going back to economic variables, we thought this was very, very interesting. When you look at polls from 2013 versus 2022, there is an almost similar statistic between percentage of young people that want to prioritize economic issues or are concerned about economic issues versus 2022. That means in the last 10 years, the apprehensions of young people on economic issues, whether it be unemployment, whether it be on poverty, whether it be on inflation, have simply not been addressed. Those apprehensions very much still exist. Coming to E2, which is emerging challenges. All of these external variables are shaping the key priorities of youth. What are those key priorities? Education and employment. And in both these aspects, there is an incredible amount of disappointment with where exactly the country is heading and what young people's prospects are. Asalaamu Alaikum. I would just like to uh, welcome Professor Dr. S. N. Iqbal, uh, the Honorable Minister for Planning, for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you have just hit us at the right time. We have just actually begun to get into the areas which might be of a tremendous amount of interest for you. So as I was mentioning, on emerging challenges, when you look at these two key factors, we see some interesting variables here. In 2015, British Council conducted a study called S Skill Disconnect in Sin, which found that there was a big gap between the labor pool and its skills versus what was being taught at universities and what was being taught at academic institutes. Unfortunately, in the seven years since, that gap still exists and young people are highly sensitive about it. The majority of the respondents believe that the education system does not meet the needs of 21st century labor. A majority of respondents also feel that university curricula is badly outdated and needs updating. Similarly, that public school systems are dysfunctional. And when we ask people for one factor that could, they could identify to determine what needed to be addressed most critically, teaching quality was the predominant factor. When we come to employment, we saw a major disparity on gender lines, as was seen in the video as well. Male respondents were 12 times more likely to be employed than females. Males were also seven times more likely to be self-employed slash entrepreneurs than females. And finally, females were seven times more likely to be unemployed than males. This is really important because when you look at the breakup of men and women with regards to education, the ratio is about two to one in favor of males. But that rises to seven to one when it comes to employment and 12 to one when it comes to uh, self-employment. And that shows a big gap 
preventing young women from joining the workforce due to external and internal factors. When we look at work environment issues, we can understand why some of these concerns exist. Low wage has been cited as the most prominent issue amongst young people as their biggest area of concern in the workplace at 62%. But when you cross analyze the data, you start to see some important factors. Transgender respondents were far more likely to cite mistreatment and sexual harassment as issues in the workplace, while female respondents were far more likely to cite low wage and family objections to work as issues. Now all of these pressures and all of these priorities, they're frustrating young people. They're helping them shape their concerns, but it's also leading them to become a bit more proactive to try and change themselves. Some of these changes are for the better and some of them are for the worse. We refer to this as effects. And when we look at effects, we have generally come to five key factors that, are being, that have been changing. So on the positive side, on the positive side, we're seeing young people become increasingly proactive in taking matters into their own hands. They're searching for opportunities for themselves. They're starting to learn new skills through the miracle of the internet. As internet infrastructure has increased, and we are seeing more digital communication than ever before, we're seeing a lot of young people engage increasingly in e-innovation. The majority of respondents believe that the internet will be the predominant source of employment. A majority of respondents feel that online freelancing is a viable career option for them. And another 68% believe that women, who previously might have been restricted due to traditional factors, can now use the internet to avail new economic opportunities. Skill enhancement shows that online learning can provide young people with the skills needed for future work. The majority of participants believe that. They also believe an increasing preference for problem solving and digital skills, as well as an increased level of optimism amongst internet users. On online expression, we also saw that internet users were far more active on political and social issues and civic activism than those who didn't use the internet. And importantly, the majority of young people also feel that they can play a more active role in mitigating climate change, suggesting they're not fatalistic about it, they want to do something about it. However, on the negatives, we're seeing an increased level of polarization also taking place due to digital media. When we did an analysis of non-internet users versus internet users, internet users were far more likely to say that the political ideology and party they support is the only one that can save Pakistan. They also were more likely to say that they don't accept the political choices and views of others if they are in conflict with their own, suggesting an increased level of divisiveness that, that might be occurring due to the rise of social media. On online conflict, two of three respondents said that they have seen material on social media that targets their communities, is intolerant of their political views, and is intolerant of their social views. This can mean a proliferation of hate material and hate speech on social media, or it can mean an increased intolerance from internet users towards accepting any other different schools of thought. So these effects are occurring simultaneously. But it would be once again superficial for us to assume that this is all happening in a silo. Key institutions and groups have a critical role to play. Given that this is the youth bulge, we are one of the youngest countries in the world, with two thirds of our population consisting of young people whether young people go forward or back is going to determine where this country is going to head. And for this purpose, we've analyzed what we feel are the key areas that need to be addressed, which takes us to enablers. We have divided this into eight distinct categories. On youth participation in policy and decision making, we feel that policymakers should have access to research and data that helps them understand their young constituents, particularly from marginalized groups. There needs to be a three-way engagement strategy between policymakers, institutions, and young people. And we need to reform planning and implementation mechanisms to have youth engagement more emphasized. On education, which is a critical need of youth, there needs to be enhanced learning in new sectors such as IT, freelance, entrepreneurship, Curriculum upgradation is key where the Higher Education Commission can play an important role. 
we need to encourage practical application over lecture-based teaching, which was a particular demand that young people had, especially amongst um, entrepreneurship and business. Enabling career counseling services is very, very important. Only one in four young Pakistanis said that they had access to career guidance, and the ones that did had a much better impression of their future careers than those that didn't. Co-curricular activities, including sports, culture, and performing arts, <coughs> should be amplified in institutes. And non-formal education and skill centers should be established for youth who have dropped out from the mainstream. On civil society and media, there needs to be a bridge established between young citizens and policymakers, particularly on social inclusion, political and civic engagement. There needs to be uh, resources created for families in the areas of mental health, gender, and career guidance. And CSOs and stakeholders can create safe spaces for advice and counseling. On politics, as I mentioned before, the disenfranchisement of youth needs to be addressed. And a big reason for that is because young people are being seen as amplifiers, not necessarily as decision makers. On politics, we suggested that young people need to have better representation for their interests at the policy level. New forums can be created for this purpose. We can use networks like the Young Parliamentarians Forum, the Young Parliamentary Associates, and other such programs like that to encourage political particip participation of young people. On health and well-being, we feel that access to health and well-being services requires special attention, particularly for vulnerable and marginalized groups. So there can be outreach on traditional as well as digital means to be doing this. On gender and social inclusion, uh, there's a tremendous need for developing an enabling environment to support more young women in taking up professional leadership positions. There need to be inclusive guidelines for policy making and implementation for policy makers and administration with specific view to young PWDs, persons with disability, transgender youth, and young people from minority communities. And finally, strengthening the implementation of mechanisms for protection and safeguarding for vulnerable groups in Pakistan. Monitoring and accountability measures need to be reviewed and improved. Coming to the last two, digital, as I mentioned before, is becoming a determining factor between youth that are optimistic that want to do something about their careers and those that perhaps lack that confidence and ability. On digital, we're suggesting that infrastructure development needs to be prioritized so that access to internet is provided to all, particularly rural areas which very much lag behind on infrastructure and IT services. Similarly, subsidizing IT service for people from disadvantaged areas will help to create more internet facilities. Digital citizenship, stakeholders should be involved to define an ethical code and guidelines that protect the right to freedom of expression, reduce dangerous or discriminatory online behavior, and promote sensible use of internet and social media. Lastly, young people, you have to be part of the solution. New advocacy groups working on emerging issues such as climate change need to be empowered to engage young people and create a bridge with representatives. Young people need to play an active role in addressing the big challenges faced by Pakistan to help engage in dialogues, advocacy programs, and local programs. And finally, young people need to exercise their right to elect their parliamentary representatives by casting their vote and encouraging others around them. This, in a nutshell, is the Next Generation Study. And we hope you'll have some important questions for us all. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much, everyone. So much, Usman. Unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, but everybody remember Usman's face and find him later on in case you want to ask him anything. Thank you so much, Usman. Great. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call on stage our guest of honor, Dr. S. N. Iqbal, the Federal Minister for the Ministry of Planning, Development, and Special Initiatives. Um, Dr. Iqbal joined this ministry in April 2022 and is responsible for overseeing all policies and divisions included in the ministry, ranging from administration social governance to information technology, infrastructure, energy, and others. Um, as a minister for planning, development, and special initiatives, Dr. Iqbal has prominently worked on various initiatives, including flood relief programs and gender equality projects. He has been working closely with the planning and implementation of CPIC, and um, he has extensive professional experience as an author, penning numerous policy papers in the domain of planning strategy and business development. Could we please have a huge round of applause for Dr. Iqbal? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Acting British High Commissioner, Management of British Council, 
youth representatives, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to speak at the launch of Pakistan, the Next Generation Research Report. Having spoken so much in English and shown to you that the minister can speak English, taking advantage of the media here, I would like to switch to Urdu so that I can also convey my message to the audience outside this hall. Aaj Pakistan Pajatarvi Salgara mana raha hai aur ye ek bohat bada saniya hai ke pajatarvi salgara pe hum jis kisam ke muashi bohran se guzar rahe hain pakistan aur ehle pakistan ye deserve nahi karte aaj pakistan duniya ke kam umar tarin mulkon mein shumar hota hai pakistan ki do tihai abadi नौजवानों पे मुश्तमिल है पाकिस्तान का मुस्तकबिल इन नौजवानों के हाथ में नहीं बल्कि पाकिस्तान का हाल भी इस नौजवान आबादी के हाथ में है तो पाकिस्तान का प्रेजेंट और फ्यूचर पाकिस्तान की नौजवान आबादी है और इस हवाले से 2013 में भी जब मैंने प्लानिंग मिनिस्ट्री का उदा संभाला था तो मैं इस बात को समझता था कि इस मुल्क की मुस्तकबिल की मंसूबा बंदी दरअसल पाकिस्तान की नौजवानों के मुस्तकबिल की मंसूबा बंदी है अगर हमने इसे अच्छी तरह कर लिया तो ये डेमोग्राफिक डिविडेंट नौजवान आबादी का बोनस पाकिस्तान को उसकी पैदावार बढ़ा के उसकी तख्लीकी सलाहियत बढ़ा के उसकी तरक्की की रफ्तार तेज करके मिल सकता है और अगर हम इन नौजवानों के मुस्तबिल में इन्वेस्ट करने में नाकाम हुए और ये नौजवानों का समुंदर अगर तालीम से हुनर से और सलाहियत से और अपॉर्चुनिटी से महरूम रहा तो ये पाकिस्तान के लिए बोनस नहीं होगा बल्कि पाकिस्तान के लिए एक बहुत बड़ी तबाही का जरिया बन सकता है क्योंकि सोशल इकोनॉमिक पॉलिटिकल कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स का ये सबसे बड़ा जरिया होगा तो अगर हमने मुस्तकबिल की तरफ बढ़ना है तो अपनी इस सबसे बड़ी ताकत को जो पाकिस्तान की एटमी ताकत जितनी बड़ी ताकत है वो नौजवानों की ताकत है इसको तालीम देनी है इसको हुनर देना है इसको वो सलाहियतें देनी है जो मुस्तबिल के लिए दरकार हैं अजीब एक चैलेंज ये है कि ये नौजवान नस्ल भी हमारी नस्ल से पीछे है मैं तो जनरेशन एक्स का भी नहीं मेरा ख्याल है जनरेशन डब्ल्यू से ताल्लुक रखता हूं लेकिन हम जनरेशन जी और अब चंद सालों में जनरेशन अल्फा का सामना करने वाले हैं तो कई जनरेशंस का गैप है हमारे और इस जनरेशन जी के दरमियान एक्स आई फिर वाई आई जी आई और ये जनरेशन कई लिहाज से पिछली जनरेशन से सोच में एस्परेशंस में अपनी जरूरतों में मुख्तलफ है और अगर हमने इस नस्ल को उसी तराजू से तोला कि जिस तराजू से पिछली नस्लें सोचती थीं तो फिर यकीनन उससे कॉन्फ्लिक्ट सोशल भी होगा और उससे ये नस्ल भी ज़ाय हो जाएगी तो हमें इस नस्ल को उन नए जावियों से देखना है कि जो आज का दौर इस नस्ल की एम्पावरमेंट के जरिए हमारे सामने नई हकीकतें पेश कर रहा है एक उसकी हकीकत की मंजर कशी या उसकी मिसाल मैं यूं देना चाहता हूं कि जो मेरी नस्ल थी अगर उसे कोई मुश्किल होती थी या उसके लिए कोई मसला होता था तो मेरे हर मसले का हल मेरे वालिद साहब के पास होता था मैं अपने वालिद साहब से पूछता था कि ये कैसे करना है आज हर वालिद अपने बच्चों से पूछ रहा है कि मैंने अपना कंप्यूटर 
اور اپنا فون کیسے ٹھیک کرنا ہے تو آج کہ بچے اپنے پیرنٹس کے لیے علم دینے کا ذریعہ ہیں ان کو نئی راہیں دینے کا ذریعہ ہیں اور ان کے معلم بنے ہوئے ہیں یہ وہ امپاورمنٹ ہے کہ جو آج کے دور نے اس نئی نسل کی کی ہے اور اگر ہم نے اس کو پوزیٹیولی امبریس نہیں کیا تو اس نسل کی ایسپریشنز اور اس کی ہوپس کو ہم ضائع کر سکتے ہیں اسی لیے منسٹری آف پلاننگ اینڈ ڈیولپمنٹ سے ہم نے پچھلے دور میں ینگ ڈیولپمنٹ فیلوز کا پروگرام شروع کیا ایک تو اس کا مقصد یہ تھا کہ پاکستان کے نوجوانوں کو ہم پبلک پالیسی کا تجربہ دیں کہ وہ ہماری وزارت میں آ کے کام کریں اور دیکھیں کہ حکومت چلانا اور حکومت کے فیصلے کرنے کی کیا ٹریڈ آفس ہوتی ہیں اس میں کیا پیراڈاکسز ہوتے ہیں چونکہ جب آپ باہر بیٹھے ہوتے ہیں تو آپ یہ سوچتے ہیں کہ حکومتیں یہ کیوں نہیں کرتی ہیں یہ کیوں نہیں کرتی ہیں لیکن جب آپ دوسری طرف آ کے دیکھتے ہیں تو آپ کو معلوم ہوتا ہے کہ حکومتوں کا سب سے بڑا چیلنج یہ ہے کہ اگر ان کے وسائل ایک سو روپے کے ہیں تو جو تقاضے ہیں باہر وہ اگر دس ہزار کے نہیں تو ایک ہزار کے تو کم از کم ضرور ہیں اور جب بھی آپ ایک سو روپے کے ساتھ ایک ہزار یا دس ہزار کی ضرورتوں کو پورا کرنا چاہیں گے تو شاید آپ کسی کو بھی مطمئن نہیں کر سکیں گے تو یہ جو وسائل کا اور ضرورتوں کا ایک بہت بڑا گیپ ہے اس میں پبلک پالیسی کس طرح ٹریڈ آف کرتی ہے کس طرح فیصلے کرتی ہے یہ چوائسز اگر ہمارے نوجوانوں کو پتا ہوں گی تو وہ بہت ساری ان پبلک پالیسی کی ضرورتوں کو اور تقاضوں کو سمجھ سکیں گے جو لیک آف کمیونیکیشن کی وجہ سے ان میں انریسٹ بھی پیدا کرتی ہیں اور دوسری ہمارے لیے اپرچونیٹی یہ تھی کہ جب چالیس ینگ ڈیولپمنٹ فیلوز منسٹری آف پلاننگ کے ساتھ وابستہ ہوں گے تو وہ ہمیں نوجوانوں کی ہوپس اینڈ ایسپریشنز بتاتے ہیں تاکہ ہم اس ملک کے ترقیاتی منصوبوں میں نوجوانوں کے ایسپریشنز کو سامنے رکھیں یہی وجہ ہے کہ ٹوینٹی تھرٹین فورٹین میں ہم نے جب ویژن ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی فائیو وضع کیا اس میں نوجوانوں کی انپٹ کو کلیدی کردار دیا اور ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی فائیو میں پاکستان کو ٹاپ ٹوینٹی فائیو اکانومیز کا ہدف دے کر ایک سفر شروع کیا تاکہ بیس سو پچیس میں ہم اپنے نوجوانوں کو ایک ایسا پاکستان دے کے جائیں کہ جو دنیا کی ٹاپ ٹوینٹی فائیو اکانومیز میں ہو اور پھر ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی فائیو میں ہم انہیں کہہ سکیں کہ یہاں تک پاکستان کو ہم لے آئے ہیں اب اس سے آگے ٹوینٹی فورٹی سیون میں جب پاکستان سو سال کا ہوگا تو آپ نے پاکستان کو ٹاپ ٹین اکانومیز میں لے کے جانا ہے مگر بدقسمتی سے وہ سفر جاری نہیں رہ سکا دو ہزار سترہ میں پرائیس وارٹر ہاؤس کوپرز نے ہمارے سفر کی ویلیڈیشن کی پرائیس وارٹر ہاؤس کوپر دنیا کی ایک بہت بڑی فرم ہے وہ دنیا کے ممالک کی درجہ بندی کرتی ہے انہوں نے ٹوینٹی سیونٹین میں جو فیوچر آؤٹلوک جاری کی تھی اس میں کہا تھا کہ پاکستان کنٹینیوز دس ٹریجیکٹری بائی ٹوینٹی تھرٹی اٹ ویل بی امنگ دا ٹاپ ٹوینٹی موسٹ پاورفل اکانومیز آف دا ورلڈ وچ مینٹ کہ وی کوڈ ہیو بین پارٹ آف جی ٹوینٹی بائی ٹوینٹی تھرٹی پرووائڈیڈ وی کنٹینیو دیٹ ٹریجیکٹری آئی ووڈ ناٹ لائک ٹو سے کہ وائی دیٹ ٹریجیکٹری واز ناٹ کنٹینیو لیکن ایک آپ کے ساتھ میں ضرور موضوع پہ بات کرنا چاہوں گا کہ آپ پاکستان کا مستقبل ہیں اور آپ کا ایکشن پاکستان کے مستقبل کی راہ اور سمت کا فیصلہ کرے گا آپ کس سمت کو اختیار کرتے ہیں اس سے فیصلہ ہوگا کہ ہم کہاں جائیں گے 
जैसे एक डॉक्टर किसी मरीज का इलाज करता है तो उस मरीज की शफा का ताल्लुक इस बात से है कि डॉक्टर ने तशखीस कितनी दुरुस्त की है अगर डॉक्टर का डायग्नोसिस ठीक नहीं है तो चाहे वो दुनिया की महंगी तरीन दवाइयां खिलाए अगर आपका मसला पेट का है और डॉक्टर जो है आपको दिल की दवाइयां दे रहा है तो चाहे वो कितनी महंगी और बेहतरीन दवाइयां हों वो कारगर नहीं होंगी तो सबसे पहला जो अमल है किसी भी दुरुस्तगी में उसका ताल्लुक है कि आप अपने मसले अपने प्रॉब्लम अपनी बीमारी की तशखीस कितनी दुरुस्त करते हैं पाकिस्तान आज सेवेंटी फिफ्थ एनिवर्सरी में आईएमएफ के सामने बेबस खड़ा है पाकिस्तान आज अपने दोस्तों से अपने कर्जे रोल ओवर कर रहा है कि चूंकि हमारा इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस बेकाबू हो चुका है अगरचे इस वक्त पूरी दुनिया एक शदीद मुआशी बहरान का शिकार है लेकिन हमारा बहरान उससे बड़ा है तो इसकी क्या वजह है आपको बहुत सी एक्सप्लेनेशन इसकी दी जाती हैं मैं आपको ये बात कहना चाहता हूं कि कोई ग्रो और क्रोई कौम अगर अपने सेल्फ इमेज को और सेल्फ स्टीम को लूज कर देती है और वो डिस्टॉर्टेड हो जाता है तो वो कभी कोई बड़ा काम नहीं कर सकती जो इंसान अपनी सेल्फ स्टीम खो देता है यहां पे जिसने साइकोलॉजी पढ़ी है वो आपको बताएगा कि लो सेल्फ स्टीम रखने वाला डिप्रेशन का मरीज बन जाता है वो अपने ऊपर एतमाद खो देता है वो हर दूसरे को खुद से अपने से बेहतर समझता है और वो हर दूसरे को अपने खिलाफ साजिश करता हुआ समझता है और वो बेबस हो के चाहे कितना भी भारी भरकम हो हटा कटा हो लेकिन जब उसकी सेल्फ स्टीम उसके दिमाग में वायरस की तरह आती है तो उसका पूरा जिसम बिस्तर के साथ लग के वो बेबस और लाचार हो के बेकार हो जाता है लेकिन अगर उसकी सेल्फ स्टीम जिंदा है तो चाहे वो अपाहज हो जाए चाहे वो अपनी जबान से अपना माफियो जमीर ना बयान कर सके और उसे अपनी बात दूसरों तक पहुंचाने के लिए कंप्यूटर का सहारा लेना पड़े तो वो व्हील चेयर के ऊपर बैठ के भी स्टीव हॉकन बन जाता है और दुनिया का बेहतरीन साइंसदान बन जाता है तो किसी भी फर्द या ग्रो के लिए जरूरी है कि उसका सेल्फ इमेज डिस्टॉर्टेड ना हो आज अगर आपको यह एक्सप्लेनेशन दी जाए कि पाकिस्तान और पाकिस्तानी कौम इसलिए पीछे रह गए कि यह दुनिया की करप्ट तरीन कौम है तो माजरत के साथ मैं उससे इतफाक नहीं करता पाकिस्तानी उतने ही ईमानदार और दयानतदार हैं कि जितनी दुनिया की कोई और कौम ईमानदार और दयानतदार है और हम में उतने ही बेईमान है कि जितने दुनिया की किसी और कौम के अंदर बेईमान है वी आर ए नॉर्मल नेशन हम इसलिए पीछे नहीं रह गए कि हम दुनिया के दूसरे मुल्कों से ज्यादा करप्ट थे हम इसलिए पीछे नहीं रह गए कि हम दुनिया के दूसरे मुल्कों से ज्यादा नालायक थे हम इसलिए पीछे नहीं रह गए कि हमारे पास दूसरे मुल्कों के मुकाबले में इंतजामी सलाहियत कमतर दर्जे की थी हम इसलिए भी पीछे नहीं रह गए कि हम अपने मुस्तबिल की मनसूबा बंदी नहीं कर सके हमारे पास बेहतरीन दिमाग भी हैं हमने बेहतरीन मनसूबा बंदी भी की और हमने दयानतदारी के साथ काम भी किया लेकिन इसके बावजूद हम दायरों के सफर में पचहत्तर सालों से दौड़ रहे हैं कि अगर दस कदम आगे उठाते हैं तो बीस कदम पीछे धकेल दिए जाते हैं तो पाकिस्तान का असल मर्ज यह है कि हम इस मुल्क के अंदर मुस्तकम पॉलिटिकल ऑर्डर या सिस्टम कायम नहीं कर सके 
جو ہمارے ملک کی پالیسیوں کو کنٹینیوٹی اور تسلسل دیتا یہ بات نوجوانوں کے لیے سمجھنا ضروری ہے کہ آپ اگر جپان سے شروع ہوں ساؤتھ کوریا ملیشیا سنگاپور انڈونیشیا ویٹنام چائنا بنگلہ دیش انڈیا ٹرکی جس ملک نے بھی پچھلے پچاس سالوں میں کامیابی سے ترقی کی ہے چاہے وہاں پہ جمہوریت تھی یا کوئی اور نظام تھا وہاں پر کم از کم دس دس سال کے سٹیبل پیریڈ ملے ہیں جس کے نتیجے میں ان کی پالیسیز نے پھل نکالا ڈیویڈنٹس دیئے گراؤنڈ ہوئیں اور اس کا نتیجہ ان کو بہتر کار کردگی میں ملا ہمارے ہاں بدقسمتی سے ہم میوزیکل چیئر کھیلتے رہے ہیں جس میں پجتر سال زائے ہو گئے ہیں تو میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ آج ہمارے لیے بڑا چیلنج یہ ہے کہ مجھ سے جب کوئی پوچھتا ہے کہ بحثیت منسٹر پلاننگ آپ اگلے سال کے وہ کیسا دیکھتے ہیں تو میں انہیں کہتا ہوں کہ میں اگلے سال کو نہیں دیکھتا میں بیس سو سنتالیس کو دیکھتا ہوں کہ جب میری جگہ اگلی نسل کا میری اولاد کی نسل کا کوئی نمائندہ یہاں پر کھڑا ہو کے نیکسٹ جنریشن کے کسی سیمینار سے ٹوینٹی فورٹی سیون میں مخاطب ہوگا تو کیا اس نوجوان کا بیس سو سنتالیس میں کندھوں پر وہی بوجھ ہوگا جو آج میری نسل کے کندھوں پر بوجھ ہے کہ ہم اپنی بہترین نیت کوشش کے باوجود وہ نتائج نہیں دیکھ سکے لہٰذا ہمارا فرض ہے کہ ہم نئی نسل کو اس بوجھ سے آزاد کریں اور اسے وہ میکرو اکنومک پولٹیکل انوائرمنٹ دیں سوشیو پولٹیکو اکنومک انوائرمنٹ دیں کہ جو اس ملک کو استحکام کے راستے پہ چلائے تاکہ یہ نوجوانوں کی انٹرپرائز ان کی صلاحیت پوری طرح قوم ہارنس کر سکے آج جب ہم نوجوانوں کی صلاحیت دیکھتے ہیں تو میں بلا شبہ کہہ سکتا ہوں کہ پاکستانی یوتھ is second to none in the world آج ہمارے نوجوان دنیا کی بہترین یونیورسٹیوں میں جا کے اپنا لوہ منوا رہے ہیں ہماری صلاحیت میں کمی نہیں ہے لیکن اگر ہم نے نوجوانوں کو مستقبل میں سٹیبلیٹی نہ دی ان کو ہم نے وہ استحکام نہ دیا کہ جس سے وہ تسلسل آ سکے جس سے کوئی قوم کامیاب ہوتی ہے تو it will be very unfair to them and to their future so لہٰذا آپ کو یہ بات سب سے پہلے سمجھنی چاہیے کہ ہمارے اندر کوئی manufacturing defect نہیں ہے ہمارے ڈیفیکٹ ہماری ریاست کے نظام کے اندر ہیں کہ جس نے اس ملک کو سٹیبلیٹی اور کنٹینیوٹی کے ساتھ نہیں چلنے دیا اور آج پاکستان کے تمام سٹیک ہولڈرز جس میں اسٹیبلشمنٹ ہے جس میں جوڈیشری ہے جس میں سیاستدان ہے ان سب کا فرض ہے کہ وہ اپنے ماضی سے سبق سیکھیں اور اپنے مستقبل کو درست کریں اور پاکستان کے نوجوانوں کا یہ فرض ہے کہ وہ پاکستان کے ہر سٹیک ہولڈر کا احتساب کریں کہ آپ پاکستان کو پاکستان کے آئین کے مطابق چلائیں آپ اس ملک کو امن اور استحکام کی طرف چلائیں میرے عزیز نوجوانوں جب کسی گھر کے اندر آگ لگی ہوتی ہے اور اس وقت اگر گھر والے ایک دوسرے سے اس بات پہ جھگڑنا شروع کر دیں کہ یہ آگ کس نے لگائی ہے تو آپ کو زیادہ دانشور ہونے کی ضرورت نہیں کہ وہ آگ اس گھر کا کیا حشر کرے گی گھر میں آگ لگی ہے اور گھر والے ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ جھگڑا کر رہے ہیں کہ یہ آگ کس نے لگائی ہے تو وہ آگ سب کو جلا کے خاکستر کر دے گی جب آگ لگی ہوگی تو سب کا فرض ہے کہ اپنے حصے کی بالٹی اٹھا کے اس آگ کو بجانے کی اندر اپنا کردار ادا کریں آج جب پاکستان اس ڈیپ اکنومک کرائیسس کا شکار ہے جو کہ ہمارے پجتر سالہ تاریخ کے 
بدترین کرائسس ہے تو یہ موقع نہیں ہے کہ ہم ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ دست و گریبان ہوں یہ موقع ہے کہ ہم ٹیم پاکستان بن کر اس ملک کو بحران سے نکال کے امن اور استحکام کے ساتھ سٹیبلائز کریں ہم اس کے بعد آپس میں اپنی مقدمے بازی بھی کر لیں گے کون اس تباہی کا کتنے ذمہ دار ہے لیکن ابھی یہ وقت لڑائی کا نہیں ہے یہ وقت کولیبریشن کا ہے اور مستقبل میں آپ کے لیے جو امپورٹنٹ بات ہے جو آرگنائزیشنز ہیں جو ورک ہے اٹ ول نو لانگر بی بیسڈ آن یونٹ آف لیبر دا فیوچر آف ورک از ان ٹیمس وہ لوگ جو ٹیمز میں بہتر کام کرنے کی صلاحیت رکھتے ہیں وہ کامیاب ہوں گے اور ٹیمز میں کام کرنے کا مقصد یہ ہے کہ آپ کے اندر کولیبریٹو صلاحیت زیادہ ہونی چاہیے اگر آپ ڈائیورسٹی کے اندر یونٹی قائم نہیں کر سکیں گے تو آپ مستقبل میں کامیاب نہیں ہو سکیں گے یہی اصول ہمارے لیے ملک کی سطح پر ہے کہ ہمارے نوجوانوں کو پاکستان میں یونٹی کولیبریشن ٹالرنس یہ ویلیوز فروغ کرنے کا چیمپئن بننا چاہیے میں آپ کے سامنے ایک مثال کھڑا ہوں کہ پولرائزیشن انسان کو کس طرح ویشی بنا دیتی ہے ایک نوجوان نے آج سے چار ساڑھے چار سال پہلے میری زندگی لینے کی کوشش کی اور اس کی چلائی ہوئی گولی آج بھی میرے جسم میں ہے اور وہ مجھے ہر روز یہ یاد دہانی کراتی ہے کہ ہم نے اپنے معاشرے سے بندوق اور پستول کی گولیوں کو نہیں بلکہ زینوں سے نفرت کی گولیوں کو ختم کرنا ہے چونکہ جب انسان کے دماغ میں نفرت اور تعصب کے وائرس پیدا ہو جاتے ہیں تو انسان انسان سے حیوان بن جاتا ہے پشاور کے اندر جو مسجد میں خود کش حملہ ہوا وہ کسی روبوٹ نے نہیں کیا وہ کسی انسان نے کیا ہے اور ایک انسان ایسے عمل پر کیسے امادہ ہوتا ہے تب امادہ ہوتا ہے کہ جب اس کے ذہن کے اندر نفرت بھر دی جائے اس کے ذہن کے اندر تعصب اور پریجوڈس بھر دیا جائے پھر وہ انسانی سوچ سے نہیں حیوانی سوچ سے آپریٹ کرنے لگتا ہے جیسے کہ کمپیوٹر کے اندر اس کے آپریٹنگ سسٹم میں وائرس آ جائے تو وہ کمپیوٹر میل فنکشن کر جاتا ہے اور وہ اس وقت تک نہیں ٹھیک ہوتا جب تک آپ اینٹی وائرس لگا کے اس کا وہ باغ یا وائرس کلیئر نہیں کرتے تو ہمیں بھی آج اپنے نوجوانوں کو پولرائزیشن سے بچانا ہے کہ جس کا یہاں پر ابھی ذکر کیا گیا پولرائز سوسائٹی از اے ریسپی فار ڈیزاسٹر اور میں آپ کو یہ بات کہنا چاہتا ہوں کہ ان آرڈر ٹو بی ایکول you don't necessarily have to be same when you start believing that to be equal you have to be same then you enter into fascist mind you are no longer a democratic mind because democracy ka essence is in pluralism or pluralism ka matlab ye hai ki main aur aap ikhtilaf rakh sakte hain rai ka لیکن اس اختلاف کے ساتھ ہم دونوں برابر کے پاکستانی ہو سکتے ہیں اور ہم دونوں برابر کے محب وطن ہو سکتے ہیں لیکن جیسے ابھی اس سروے میں آپ نے دیکھا کہ سوشل میڈیا کے ذریعے ایک انکریزنگ ٹرینڈ ہے نوجوانوں کے اندر کہ اگر آپ میری رائے سے متفق نہیں ہیں تو آپ پھر پاکستانی نہیں ہیں اگر آپ میرے ورشن آف ریلیجن سے متفق نہیں ہیں تو آپ پھر آپ کا مذہب بھی کم تر ہے اور آپ میرے برابر نہیں ہیں یہ وہ سب سے زیادہ خطرناک وائرس ہے کہ جسے ہمیں ختم کرنا ہے آخر میں 
I want to say that recognizing that youth is our future, we are undertaking number of initiatives which we hope will really make big impact on new generation's aspirations. First, हम पूरे पाकिस्तान के अंदर 60,000 के करीब यूथ इंटर्नशिप्स के प्रोग्राम्स लॉन्च कर रहे हैं जिसके नतीजे में हमारे नौजवानों को पब्लिक सेक्टर डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम और प्राइवेट सेक्टर में छह महीने से एक साल की इंटर्नशिप के जरिए जॉब रेडीनेस मिलेगी और उनकी एम्प्लॉयबिलिटी होगी नंबर टू हम एक लाख नौजवानों को अगले तीन सालों में आईटी स्किल्स की ट्रेनिंग देंगे ताकि वो पाकिस्तान को आईटी मैप के ऊपर आगे लेके जाएं क्योंकि हमारे नौजवान आबादी और जो डिजिटल रेवोल्यूशन है इन दोनों को अगर हम कनेक्ट कर दें तो अगले 10 से 15 सालों में पाकिस्तान कैन बिकम एन इंफॉर्मेशन पावर इन द वर्ल्ड तो एक लाख नौजवानों को सर्टिफिकेशन के प्रोग्राम्स ऑफर करके हम उन्हें इनेबल करेंगे कि वो इस मैदान में जाएं। इसी तरह एक लाख नौजवानों को हम टेक्निकल और वोकेशनल एजुकेशन दे रहे हैं ताकि इसके जरिए भी उनकी मार्केटेबिलिटी बढ़ सके तीसरे दर्जे पे हमने पाकिस्तान में नौजवानों को एम्पावर करने के लिए हायर एजुकेशन प्रोग्राम को एक्सपैंड किया है थर्टीन एटीन में भी किया था और उसे मजीद एक्सपैंड कर रहे हैं और वी हैव स्टार्टेड इनिशिएटिव जिसमें के मैं समझता हूं कि पाकिस्तान के नौजवानों के लिए इमेंस अपॉर्चुनिटीज हैं 75 फाइव स्कॉलरशिप्स इस साल हुकूमत ने पचहत्तरवीं सालगराह पे ऑफर किए हैं कोई पाकिस्तानी नौजवान जो दुनिया की टॉप 25 फाइव यूनिवर्सिटीज केम्ब्रिज ऑक्सफर्ड हार्वर्ड प्रिंसटन स्टैनफर्ड एम आई टी कोलंबिया शिकागो यूनिवर्सिटी पेंसिल्वेनिया सिंगवा किस जो दुनिया की टॉप ट्वेंटी फाइव यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं उसमें अगर कोई पाकिस्तानी नौजवान जिन मजामीन को हमने चुना है उनमें दाखिला लेगा तो उसको गवर्नमेंट ऑफ पाकिस्तान पी एच डी के लिए और मास्टर्स के लिए स्कॉलरशिप देगी ताकि हमारा बेस्ट ऑफ द बेस्ट टैलेंट जो है वो दुनिया की बेस्ट यूनिवर्सिटी से पढ़कर वापस आए और पाकिस्तान की खिदमत करें इसी तरह 2016 में और 17 में हमने एक इनिशिएटिव लॉन्च किया जिसका नाम यूएस पाकिस्तान नॉलेज कॉरिडोर था और उसमें जो यूएस की टॉप यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं उनके लिए 1000 थाउजेंड स्कॉलरशिप्स हैं पर ईयर और 10 सालों के लिए दस हजार स्कॉलरशिप हैं कि कोई पाकिस्तान का नौजवान अगर अमेरिका की टॉप यूनिवर्सिटीज में दाखला लेता है तो उसको स्कॉलरशिप दिया जाएगा पीएचडी के लिए क्योंकि हम मुस्तकबिल के लिए स्ट्रेटेजिक ह्यूमन रिसोर्स का एक क्रिटिकल मैस बिल्ड करना चाहते हैं जो हमारे पास नहीं दूसरी कौमों के पास है तो इट इज ए ग्रेट अपॉर्चुनिटी और मुझे अफसोस से कहना पड़ता है कि एक हजार स्कॉलरशिप की अभी भी यूटिलाइजेशन दस फीसद भी नहीं हम कर पा रहे हैं तो नौजवानों को चाहिए कि इसमें बढ़ चढ़कर हिस्सा लें ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट को भी हमने इसी तरह ऑफर किया है कि जो बर्तानिया की टॉप फाइव यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं उसमें हम चाहेंगे कि बर्तानिया के साथ और ब्रिटिश काउंसिल के साथ मिलकर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैम्ब्रिज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ ऑक्सफर्ड लंडन स्कूल ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स किंग्स कॉलेज और इंपीरियल कॉलेज जैसे जो इदारे हैं उसमें जो पाकिस्तानी दाखला लेगा इन शाह उसको हम स्कॉलरशिप देने की कोशिश करेंगे ताकि बेस्ट ऑफ आर बेस्ट यूथ शुड हैव बेस्ट ऑफ द बेस्ट अपॉर्चुनिटी इन द वर्ल्ड कि वो पढ़े और वो तजुर्बा और इल्म पाकिस्तान लेकर आए और उससे पाकिस्तान को वो डेवलप करें इसी तरह हमने इस साल से नौजवानों को एक लाख लैपटॉप्स भी यूनिवर्सिटीज में देने का दोबारा स्कीम को शुरू किया है ताकि उन्हें डिजिटली एम्पावर किया जाए 
और उससे वो डिजिटल हमारे वर्क्स पे डिजिटल वर्ल्ड के अंदर हमारे वॉरियर्स बन सकें आईटी रेवोल्यूशन की तरफ हमको लेकर जाएं और आज जो हमने पिछले दस सालों में वन मिलियन लैपटॉप दिए उसके नतीजे में नौजवानों ने पाकिस्तान को थर्ड बिगेस्ट ई लैंसिंग कंट्री बना दिया हम 250 नए मिनी स्पोर्ट्स कॉम्प्लेक्स पूरे मुल्क के अंदर बना रहे हैं ताकि स्पोर्ट्स के जरिए नौजवानों की सलाहियतों को फरोक दिया जाए और पाकिस्तान के नौजवान खिलाड़ी दुनिया के विक्ट्री स्टैंड्स पर दोबारा खड़े होते नजर आए और आपको मालूम है कि स्पोर्ट्स को प्रमोट करने के जुर्म में मैं सवा दो महीने सजाए मौत के कैदियों की चक्की काट आया और मेरे खिलाफ केस इसलिए बनाया गया कि वाई डिड आई फंड नारोवाल स्पोर्ट्स सिटी प्रोजेक्ट विच वॉज सपोज टू प्रोवाइड स्टेट ऑफ द आर्ट ट्रेनिंग फैसिलिटी टू यंग स्पोर्ट्स मैन ऑफ पाकिस्तान बट नेवर द लेस वो जो हुआ सो हुआ उससे हम रुके नहीं हैं अगर एक स्पोर्ट्स कॉम्प्लेक्स बनाने पर मुझे सजा मिली थी तो उसके नतीजे में हमने टू हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी स्पोर्ट्स कॉम्प्लेक्स बनाने शुरू कर दिए हैं सो वी आर अंडरटेकिंग नंबर ऑफ इनिशिएटिव हर पाकिस्तान की यूनिवर्सिटी में हम यंग पीस एंड डेवलपमेंट कोर का चैप्टर बना रहे हैं ताकि नौजवानों को पब्लिक पॉलिसी के साथ और डेवलपमेंट के साथ जोड़ा जाए और उनको मौका दिया जाए कि वो कम्युनिटी में जाके काम करें वो मुल्क के पॉलिसी इश्यूज पे डिबेट्स करें अपनी सजेशंस हमें दें ताकि उनको हम हकूमत की पॉलिसी मेकिंग में शामिल कर सकें और हमने प्लानिंग कमीशन के अंदर जेंडर यूनिट और यूथ यूनिट भी कायम किया है ताकि पाकिस्तान के हर डेवलपमेंट प्रोजेक्ट के अंदर जेंडर और यूथ परस्पेक्टिव को शामिल किया जाए मैं आपसे ये बात कह के इजाजत लूंगा आज पाकिस्तान के सामने बड़े चैलेंजेस हैं लेकिन इनमें से कोई चैलेंज पाकिस्तानी कौम की सलाहियत से बड़ा नहीं है हमें मायूस होने की बजाय इस चैलेंज को एक अपॉर्चुनिटी में क्रिएट करना है और पचहत्तर सालों से जो हमने गलत आदतें अपनाई हुई थी उनको छोड़ना है हमने ज्यादा मेहनत करनी है हमने अपनी प्रोडक्टिविटी बढ़ानी है हमने एंट्रप्रनोरशिप के जरिए अपने मुल्क की एक्सपोर्ट्स को बढ़ाना है हमने आईएमएफ और दोस्त मुल्कों की इमदाद की तरफ देखने की बजाय अपने वसाइल अपने बाजू अपने एंटरप्राइज के जरिए पाकिस्तान की एक्सपोर्ट्स को 32 बिलियन डॉलर से 100 बिलियन डॉलर तक कम से कम मुद्दत में लेके जाना है अगर हम अपनी एक्सपोर्ट्स को अगले पांच आठ सालों में हंड्रेड बिलियन डॉलर तक ले जाएं तो ये आईएमएफ की बैसाखियां ये गैर मुल्की इमदाद की बैसाखियां हमेशा के लिए हम तोड़ फेंक सकते हैं तो अब वक्त मायूसी का नहीं है वक्त आगे बढ़ने का है और वक्त आगे बढ़ के कुछ कर गुजरने का है और जो इस मौके से फायदा उठाएगा मुस्तबिल उसी का होगा तो आइए अहद करें मैं आपसे अहद करता हूं कि हम इन शाह जो भी नौजवानों को एम्पावर करने की प्रोजेक्ट होगा जो एम्पावर करने का इनिशिएटिव होगा उसे सपोर्ट करेंगे लेकिन पाकिस्तान के नौजवानों को ग्लास हाफ एम नहीं देखना ग्लास हाफ फुल देखते हुए इस ग्लास को पूरा भरने के लिए अपनी बेहतरीन सलाहियत को बुरुकार लाना है और मुझे यकीन है कि इन शाह हम मिलकर चंद सालों में पाकिस्तान को टर्न अराउंड करेंगे और पाकिस्तान वापस उसी ट्रेजेक्टरी पर आएगा जिस पर दुनिया कह रही थी कि यह दुनिया की टॉप इकोनॉमीज और फास्टेस्ट ग्रोइंग इमर्जिंग इकोनॉमी के सफर पे चल रहा है मैं ब्रिटिश काउंसिल का शुक्रगुजार हूं कि इन्होंने इस रिसर्च के जरिए हमें मौका दिया है कि हम समझें कि पाकिस्तान के नौजवान क्या चाहते हैं हमने नौजवानों की आवाज को सुना है और हम इन शाह इसकी रोशनी में पाकिस्तान के डेवलपमेंट प्लान्स को मजीद नौजवानों के साथ अलाइन करेंगे क्योंकि एम्पावरिंग यूथ मीन्स एम्पावरिंग पाकिस्तान पाकिस्तान जिंदाबाद
thank you so much, sir, for that very inspiring note. Um, I think Pakistani youth is really second to none, and it's really heartening to see that so much work is already being done to channel their energies and their brilliance. Um, we've spent this entire day listening to young people, listening to their voices. We've done a deeper dive into the research and its findings, and I think now we would like to turn to experts and practitioners to see what it is we can do to channel these recommendations and to concretely implement them. I'd like to call on stage Vajiha Irfan to moderate the panel. Uh, Vajiha has been working in the development sector for more than 16 years in various organizations. Right now, Vajiha works at the British Council and she is the head of non-formal education unit. At the non-formal education unit, uh, we have an objective of supporting young leaders and influencers to contribute to trust building, cohesion and stability in their societies and represent their communities on a local, regional and national stage. Can we please have a huge round of applause for Vajiha? Assalamu alaikum everyone and thank you for sitting through uh, the event. Now that we have actually um, listened to the recommendations of this uh, report, uh, we'll be calling on um, a panel on stage uh, who are um, basically coming from different walks of life, uh, uh, representing the government, uh, academia, CSOs and media. So uh, we'll look into how these recommendations can actually be taken forward at a structured manner. So let me uh, first of all introduce uh, the panel. First of all, I'd call on stage Dr. Adnan Rafiq. Dr. Adnan is a member of, um, is, is member governance, innovation and reforms at the Planning Commission of Pakistan. Uh, and previously he has worked with the government departments and was the country director for uh, United States uh, Institute of Peace. Uh, please, uh, I would request you to clap with the panel members. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd uh, like to call Dr. Uzma Qureshi. Uh, Dr. Uzma Qureshi holds a post-doctorate post in gender equity and higher education, and she is currently serving as the Vice Chancellor of Women's University in Multan, and has previously uh, worked at various universities at higher ranks throughout Pakistan. Uh, my next panel member is uh, Mr. Atif Sheikh. Mr. Atif Sheikh is a senior uh, disability inclusive development advisor with over 20 years of experience uh, in providing training and advocacy and is currently is the executive director of a special talent exchange program also known as STEP that works around mainstreaming disab disabled people in the society. Welcome uh, Mr. Atif. My next panel member is Ms. Shaista Aisha. She's the CEO and director for Seed Ventures. She's an ex-banker and has a vast experience uh, in SMEs in Pakistan and has supported uh, improving entrepreneur entrepreneurial scenarios uh, in different levels. And last but not the least, I'd like to call Mr. Fasi Zaka. Mr. Fasi Zaka is a public uh, policy professional who has worked extensively in the development sector in com communications, research, and governance. He's also a fixture at the media uh, as op-ed writer, um, radio show host, and, tele and television actor. A uh, round of applause for all the members. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, panel members, for being here. Uh, without further ado, I'll go to the questions. And first of all, if I can um, come to Dr. Adnan Yu. Um, we have seen, Dr. Adnan, that this government and the previous government um, has taken various measures to provide uh, support and services for young people, for example, the scholarships, business loans, and many other opportunities. So what do you think uh, this report has highlighted and the, uh, the government uh, would be interested to take forward? Ji, thank you so much. And first of all, let me congratulate British Council and its team uh, for uh, putting together such an informative report. I think this serves as a barometer of young people in Pakistan. 
uh, and British Consul, as we know previously through active citizens programs and many other programs that I have been also uh, closely associated with, has already contributed uh, towards uh, youth empowerment and uh, bridging the divide between uh, the government and the young people. So, a uh, lot of uh, kudos for that. Um, the question you asked, the way I look at it, of course, we all know the material needs that the young people have. They need jobs, they need health, education, uh, they need, you know, uh, facilities that uh, they, uh, the, the aspirations, the expectations that they have. But I think uh, I would like to focus on another aspect which has also been highlighted in the report but is generally overlooked. And I think that aspect is that, in my view, young people want to exercise agency. Essentially, they want to be heard, they want to be part of decision making, they want to be part of policy making, they want, uh, you know, to have control over their lives, right? And I think, uh, and there are disparities. Of course, there are disparities on the basis of gender, on the basis of class, uh, regional, uh, rural, urban, and so on and so forth. So I think providing young people opportunities where they can not only express themselves but actually shape the collective decision-making processes that we have either through political participation or participation in the policy-making. I think that's one of the key areas that will lead to youth empowerment and will lead to uh, decisions, policies, and programs that will benefit uh, the youth more. And I'm uh, glad uh, to, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge uh, Minister for planning very eloquently uh, listed uh, a number of initiatives that the government has taken in this regard. But I would like to add a couple of uh, initiatives to them. One is, uh, you know, we've established a Champions of Reforms Network which brings together leading professionals from around the world to participate in the decision-making process, starting with the Ministry of Planning itself. This was also a brainchild of uh, Minister uh, Asan Iqbal himself. And already, uh, you know, young people who are skilled, who are educated in their fields, are contributing to the key decisions and the policies that uh, we are uh, developing at the ministry. So I would actually invite uh, participants in the room to just Google Champions of Reforms. Uh, there's an online link. Please join the network and you will see how you will be practically able to shape uh, policy making and decision making uh, in the country. So um, I would just stop here. I think local bodies uh, provide another great avenue through which we can nurture the and harness the potential of young people to get involved in uh, collective decision making in the country, in the political process. Um, also, there was a lot of discussion on economy. I think the biggest uh, game changer on the economic front can be greater participation of women uh, in the labor force. That is another area that we hope that through the internship schemes that the minister spoke about, through the training, um, facilities and opportunities that the government is working towards can translate, uh, you know, this um, the potential of women in Pakistan uh, into substantial and concrete uh, economic growth. So I'll just stop here and uh, let other parties friends add to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. Very useful um, initiatives that you've shared that the government has already starting and planning to start. Um, I think the youth here would be really interested to take, uh, you know, in, uh, apply for these and take this forward. Uh, can I now come to Dr. Uzma uh, from academia? Uh, so as we have seen, Dr. Uzma, that in the report, young respondents have highlighted education and employment as the top concerns. Uh, in your view, how can the higher education sector transform and offer the quality education uh, that young people have demanded? Thank you very much, Vajiha, for uh, making me part of this discussion. Before I say anything about the higher education, I would say that education as a whole, 
needs to play its role very effectively. Uh, what has happened in the past so many years is that the um, education sector remains entangled in traditional structures and the ways of teaching and learning. We need to challenge that and revisit that and rethink how education works. In higher education, usually students, about 11% of um, 11, uh, 18 and 25 year olds have access to higher education. And that sometimes I feel, I've worked in higher education for the past 25 years, I've seen that it becomes too little too late um, because the, the main attitudes, uh, understanding of their existence, identity, um, is formed during the early years of education. And by the time they reach universities, they are misinformed, confused, as the report has indicated. And the universities now need to also need to get out of their traditional frameworks. Um, we have curriculum which has been um, sort of uh, prescribed by Higher Education Commission, but I'm working now in Multan. Before that, I was working in Lahore. So I see that there are certain very contextual, very important contextual factors which, which we need to take into account when we are trying to implement the curriculum. Uh, so our students come from very deprived areas, women, um, who are looking to um, understand themselves um, they need, they are fighting with themselves and they are fighting for themselves kind of a um, situation they have for themselves and uh, I feel that they need to be empowered. And empowerment does not come with uh, pigeonholing um, what they learn or doesn't come with a very structured approach to education. We need to have open university structures where they get maximum opportunity to explore the subject area which they've selected, move and uh, see what suits them best. And also, um, this disconnect between academia and industry needs to be addressed as well. We do have offices of um, research, innovation, and commercialization. The main purpose of these offices is to um, have connection with industry. But I think we also need, there's a disconnect with the society and also with the political, um, uh, I would say, uh, participation as well when it comes to universities. So we need to strengthen student societies. We need to strengthen and improve um, channels where students can have voices to influence policy making at the university level. Uh, we have done that. We have Women Development Center. We have um, other um, centers where students come, career counseling and job placement centers where students are given uh, insight into what uh, job market is there for them and how they can create jobs for themselves through entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship and for others also. So from uh, seeking job to creating job is also being addressed but still I feel because of the constraints of bureaucratic structures that we have that entangle the universities and education institutions, the innovation doesn't get the chance to expand uh, really effectively. So I think uh, slowly but surely, as um, you know, these reports inform us better. I was, uh, as, as, an, as a vice chancellor myself, I was thinking this is a 4E model is very important, uh, which we can adapt uh, to look at our own policies and practices at the university level and see how well we are playing our role as enablers, uh, whether we are able to empower our students, you know, uh, by helping them understand their environment, what is going around. You know, creating a critical mass is extremely important. People who know their rights and are aware of their responsibilities and they also know what channels are there through which they can uh, make this difference. And that is the role which universities now need to take, not just through teaching and learning methodologies, but also through the curriculum that is there that needs to be revamped, and also through um, engaging students in um, uh, university level policy making. It would be ideal if they could be part of uh, higher education commission and could be made part of uh, different committees that are there in higher education commission so that their voices are there. Their voices are extremely, the frustration comes from the fact that 
they get uh, forcefully silenced by their teachers, the kind of um, teaching methodologies that we employ and the kind of um, leadership we have in the universities. So they need to be made self-leaders who are confident, who are well prepared, have the necessary skills and they can then uh, move on in, they can have the confidence to be part of the university community, can connect with the communities they come from and also then that would be I think uh, 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 a natural outcome that they will be able to locate themselves well in their fields. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, would like to learn from other panelists as well. Uh, can you hear me? I think now you can hear me. Thank you so much Dr. Osma, no. very useful and uh, you know bringing people from different walks of life and trying to uh, trying to involve them in decision making is really important uh, i'll come to mr atif now um atif sahab uh, the report highlights that there is an urgent need for involving young people in policy and decision making uh, something that uh, dr uzma has also highlighted uh, you have worked with the government, you have worked with the UN agencies and young people with disabilities uh, for policy development. Uh, how would you recommend this inclusion process to be taken forward and sustained in the longer run? Uh, thank you very much, Fajia. <coughs> uh, I'm uh, audible through this one. Okay, good. Thank you. Before uh, coming to the question which you have raised that how we can involve young people with disabilities in the decision making processes. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to re-emphasize one point that the issue of disability, particularly about young boys and girls with disabilities has never been discussed at the national level on any influential platform. So that's why they, are, they have not been part of any mainstream policy. They have been excluded. So I would like to thank British Council team uh, for including the voices of persons with disabilities once again in this next generation report. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for the British Council, please. British, I would refer one of the, another report, report published by British Council which was moving from the margins. In that report, uh, it was highlighted that the people with disabilities face four kinds of barriers which stop them to be part of the mainstream society. Disability is all about enabling environment. If people with disabilities are given the environment to grow, to work, to study in the same school, they can be part of the society. So there are four barriers which have been discussed in the previous discussion which I would like to refer here. The attitudinal barrier. If the negative attitude of the society about disability discriminates them and they are confined in their houses as their life prisoner. So if the environment towards disability is changed, they are included, the disability is accepted as a diversity, they can be part of the community. Somehow if they fight against the barrier of negative attitude and stigma, there's another barrier which is environmental barrier. The environmental barrier, like they don't have access to any transportation system, they don't have access to the mainstream schools, universities, or the workplace. So even if they are willing to come out of their houses, even if their society, their community is supporting for them, the environmental barriers stop them to be part of the society again. And the third barrier are the communication barrier. Like if, if I would start speaking in French, most of the people in this room will not be able to understand what I'm saying. That it doesn't mean that they are hearing impaired. This is just a linguistic barrier. Similarly, if we promote sign language in the country, people with hearing impairment will not be disabled. They will be part of the whole services system. So this, the third barrier is the communication barrier. If we enable the information which is available everywhere in accessible formats, so people with disabilities again will be part of the main, mainstream ecosystem. And the fourth barrier, which is also mentioned in this uh, latest report, Next Generation Report 2023, that these are the policy barriers. Institutional policies are not disabled friendly. If a person, let me give you an example that a person qualifies from 
the best university in the country or in the world. He or she got a degree and the going for employment or livelihood opportunity. The workplace is not accessible for them. So the degree is useless and the quota system is useless. They will not be able to work with the people where other people are working. So enabling the policy, institutional policies create an inclusive work environment which enables people with disabilities to work at the same workplace. So these are the four barriers which are stopping people with disabilities to be part of the mainstream society. Now what we can do, the first thing, we have to listen to the voices of people with disabilities themselves. They are, they are not a homogeneous group of community. They are heterogeneous people. Their disability is a diversity. Every single person sitting in this room has a diversified identity unique identity. Every person has a different needs. All of you like who are coming to attend this meeting, coming on a vehicle, a car, or a bicycle, or something. So you are using wheel and a chair. So everybody in this room is using a wheelchair. But your wheelchair is different from the others. Some people are using wheelchair to come inside the room, but most of the people have parked their wheelchairs outside the room. So you create require the facilities which you need to make your life easy. So if people with disabilities have the, all those facilities which make their life easy, they can be part of the society. They can grow uh, like other people are doing. Now, now coming to the support, in the support which, which is mentioning about the environment, which I already mentioned, and the second is the emerging challenges. Same challenges which youth without disability in Pakistan are facing are being faced by youth with disabilities, but they are sometimes doubled. Like for example, like with person with visual impairment, they are able to work on digital, new digital platforms, but these digital platforms need to be made accessible, which requires a little effort. So people with disabilities can be part of the society if they are part of the policy making processes, if their voices are being heard, if they are, and about the policies, like we always use a slogan that nothing about us without us. So if policies are being made, the voices of people with disabilities should be included in it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Atif Saab. Thank you so much. Um, can I come to Fasi now? Hello. Thank you. Um, Fasi, the report actually brings forward digital as a powerful and preferred platform for engagement by the young people. Uh, however, we have seen that social media can be used both ways, uh, in a positive or negative way. Uh, as a media strategist, uh, what will be your recommendations for all stakeholders that are considering to choose social media platforms uh, to engage with the young people? So, um, I think one of the things about this question is that quite often the digital world is seen as an entirely separate space. However, the digital world does only one thing, which is reflect offline problems. So for example, uh, there's research that's been done in Kenya, and they've discovered that out of most of the hate speech, most of it doesn't have followers, but the most effective hate speech comes from very few people who have not been touched by the authorities. So your solution is not necessarily binding online, but it's actually going offline against people. Pakistan is the same in that respect. So the question of choosing which platform, some reward pictures, some reward text, some have very quick takes. The question really is, is that what is coming into it? And the problem is, again, offline. And I'll explain that. I think in the 2009 report, I was going through some of the background materials. And one of the most interesting things that was said back then, uh, there was a lot of terrorism issues. People were framing Pakistan's questions in terms of insecurity. And one kid wrote that insecurity for me is not my fear to go out and be killed by a bomb blast. Insecurity for me is jab main exam ka paper parcha deta hoon, mujhe marks sahi milenge ya nahi. Jab main kisi job ko apply karta hoon, safarish se ho hoga ya merit se hoga. And insecurity in that level has not changed in this past decade whatsoever. If you look at this current report, the kind of issues people have around the economy is fundamentally fairly similar 
to issues they had back then. I think, again, in terms of platforms and online things, the real question that we have to ask is the system coherence of Pakistan itself. If you look at Pakistan right now, we have a severe economic crunch. We have elite captured. We also have an internal uh, contest for hegemony between institutions. And these things, now the question is, is that if you reach out to people, you become more accessible. What is it that the state can give in return? Seeking opinions and increasing expectations also has its own downside. I'll give you an example. We talk about this uh, you know, demographic dividend. This age structure started in 1990. We've wasted 25 years. We had to invest in the people, we had to invest in the kids. These kids, once they grow older, and we might become a nation that grows old before it grows rich, will become a pressure cooker. Uh, we've put a lot, I've seen in the report and all that, but it's interesting, just in the past couple of months, we now have technologies that are going to change the nature of even online commerce and opportunities. Whole sectors that Pakistan is benefiting from now will no longer be needed once it's scaled. So again, I think the real question for us is what can happen? I think one of the most amazing things that this report has brought out and I think is very relevant to what happens in the online space, like Pakistan has a problem. The one area is that if you leave it to the platforms to regulate, They've always failed. We've seen that in the West. You leave it to the government of Pakistan and they'll ban Wikipedia for two days as they've already done. So the question is, like, how do we move forward with something like this? And what we can see, at least from this report, which I found really interesting, which I haven't seen in the previous ones, and I see this online as well, is that a lot of compassion has increased. People with disabilities, transgender, there are much more people but there is also a paradox at work. Both political polarization has increased, and what is happening is that people are identifying with better values, but they have put a large number of exceptions to those values. I don't believe an innocent people should be killed except this and that, okay. right? And for that, I think when we talk about education, and yes, it suffers hugely, it's failing students, but we've also fetishized education. The universities will not create great human beings if society is failing at a different level. And to put that kind of pressure on both universities or schools is a problem. So I think like with the online space, when we look at some positive trends and that there are paradoxical trends also increasing, the real issue for us as maybe strategists on the media is yes, I think schools should have digital literacy programs so that they can identify things. I think one of the interesting things that uh, the minister said was that we now ask our kids how to start the computer. I was uh, talking to my father a few months ago and I realized one really interesting thing. You ask their generation, what about this uncle of yours? What a great man. What a grandeur. What a this, that. Ours is the first generation when they ask us about our uncles we see the stupid things they say on WhatsApp. So we, we will not have the same opinion. And the problem is, again, digital literacy. There's a lot of people who are acting for immoral purposes driven by actually a moral drive because they believe what they're reading. So I think uh, on the question of, like, in general, on the digital strategy of what people need to do, I think one further piece of research, which would be very interesting, is to look at how we have declared values, how we've got exceptions to those, because in order for us to challenge these problematic areas, because again, in, um, I'll give you another side example. I have friends in the media who do moderation on the pages. And they very often have to close it because you find a woman's been killed for X, Y, Z reason, and you'll find a whole series of comments that will apologize for the act. And after a while, you realize that, you know, even if you ask that person, there's going to be an issue around how they frame it, why they think this is an exception. I think this is something that your research is also showing. I think on the question of whether the state's responsibility and its own coherence, 
I think Adnan is working on that, and that's something that is incredibly important. We have these opportunities. I actually think sports is a great thing because access to public spaces and for children to only get their opinions from the net is a problematic socialization. So I mean, I'm actually arguing that the space and the degree to which the internet or the digital is a solution for our problems is probably misguided unless the whole system is also changing at the same time. Very useful point, Fasi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your point of view. Uh, can I now come to Ms. Shaista? Um, Shaista, the report highlights the vulnerabilities young people experience in their lives. For example, life's choices, uh, discrimination due to gender and belief, uh, bullying and harassment due to various reasons. You have worked with young people directly and across Pakistan. Um, how would you relate your experience with uh, the report findings and what kind of youth engagement approaches would you recommend? So, um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate British Council on launching this. Sorry, um, Dr. Sir Atif needs to leave, so we can just let him go and then you can continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for Sir Atif. Thank you so much, sir. Gee, Gee. So I'd just like to congratulate you all on the launch of this report and I think uh, it's quite momentous to get this kind of insight into how the youth are thinking. Um, the report and the statistics uh, that have been highlighted, you know, they present to us a lot of opportunities. Can I be bilingual if that's okay? Okay. Sure. So, I was very happy to see that, uh, you know, in terms of identity, a lot of them look at themselves as Pakistani rather than, you know, identifying with a religion. And that presents a great opportunity for the, for the future challenges that this country might be facing. So, I think it's important, uh, one specific area, that uh, we work together on fostering a sense of national identity and unity through possibly programs or uh, initiatives that can celebrate uh, diversity and common values, right? So if they're proud to be Pakistani, I think we need to have more initiatives that help them celebrate that. The second is that uh, we need to emphasize the importance of education and financial security as a path to growth. And that has to be talked about more and more. Uh, and as the path to a fulfilling future. Then, of course, you know, as we saw that there was political apathy, I think it's important that they're part of political uh, engagement through programs that help them get acquainted with the system, the constitution, their rights as citizens, uh, you know, and understand the system and how can they, they can play a more uh, active part in it. And as the minister was saying, you know, that they're introducing a program for fellowships. I think it's important to see how a policy is made and structured and how it is then implemented. Uh, we need more social uh, and economic development and empowerment programs that can provide our youth with the resources, the skills, uh, the training and the mentoring. We're uh, running, we're actually doing a lot of work with the youth. We have uh, one of the largest uh, uh, entrepreneurship development programs that we're doing in uh, collaboration with Princess Trust International UK. And uh, we train children from the ages of 13 to 17 in entrepreneurship on SDGs and sustainability. And we teach them how to set up their, whole, uh, their own social enterprises. Now one could question that at that young age, mein, you know, uh, they're not necessarily going to take up an entrepreneurial career, possibly. But the thing is that you give them the tools, you empower them, because ultimately, these social challenges or economic challenges, hai, uh, you know, their scope is so big that they can't solve it from the government, or one stakeholder or two stakeholders can't solve it. The need is that you equip your young generation, ko, uh, you equip them with the tools and the skills that can help them contribute to alleviating the problem. Solving it, I mean, we had such great examples. There was Rutaba, there was this young lady who set up a biogas plant and she's engaged communities. The thing is, if you give them the tools in the right direction, they, they will be able to manage and they will be able to do it. 
one of the things that we're missing and I feel, you know, I think even he talked about it is that हम हम कैरेक्टर बिल्डिंग की जो रिस्पांसिबिलिटी है वो हम एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशंस में डाल दें बहुत हैवी है ये रिस्पांसिबिलिटी आई थिंक वन अदर पार्ट और मे बी ए पार्ट ऑफ योर फ्यूचर रिसर्च कैन बी टॉकिंग टू पेरेंट्स बिकॉज दैट्स वेर इट ऑल स्टार्ट्स फ्रॉम यू नो अ लॉट ऑफ दैम डोंट अग्री विद देयर पेरेंट्स ऑन वैल्यूज अ लॉट ऑफ दैम डोंट अग्री विद देयर पेरेंट्स ऑन करियर चॉइसिस एंड आई थिंक पेरेंट्स शुड हैव ऑल्सो बीन प्रेजेंट इन दिस रूम यू नो एन अंडरस्टैंडिंग की यूथ प्रोजेक्ट्री किधर मूव कर रही है बिकॉज सारा डिसेंशन वहीं से शुरू होता है मेंटल हेल्थ इशूज़ वहाँ से आपके शुरू होते हैं और फिर वो यू नो दे जस्ट कास्ट केट डाउन द प्रॉब्लम बिकम्स बिगर एंड बिगर वी ऑल्सो नीड टू स्टार्ट अर्ली एंड हेयर अगेन यू नो विद इन एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन आई थिंक वी नीड टू लुक एट वट द मॉडल इज डूइंग वट आर वी चर्निंग आउट राइट आर वी सो you know stem is important uh, but so is talking to our kids about uh, you know civic responsibility uh, we don't teach them so uh, they don't understand how to be a more uh, positively contributing citizen to society we need to talk to them about climate change and sustainability early on so they can learn how to reduce wastage you know quite early in their lives then we need to talk to them about collaborations and networking because you know working in teams is going to be the future but are we you know teaching them that or extending that kind of education so i think all stakeholders play a major role media ka apna role hai narrative building mein education ka apna role hai uh, agar hamare jaise institutions ko dekhne so you know giving them the tools the mentorship the guidance um and creating those linkages between different stakeholder organizations that can help them progress sure. okay thank you so much shaista very useful um we had um, other questions from the audience but i think due to shortage of time we'll skip that but overall um i think uh, what is coming out of this discussion is that all the stakeholders uh, from various walks of life need to work together to enable youth and provide them different venue venues so that they can flourish and you know uh, make a difference for this country as well so thank you so much the panel members and uh, i'll now hand over to isa uh, for closing of the event a uh, big round of applause for our panel members thank you thank you vitu yeah thank you to our panelists you're absolutely right it's a it's a colossal challenge and one that can't be a single entity or individuals responsibility i think we need to collectively come together and um find ways to channel our young people um in a more effective manner um before we close for the day i'd like to call on stage the regional head for non formal education south asia sadia who is also um a driving force behind the next generation researches and she was uh, here with the first one as well sadia can we please have a huge round of applause for sadia thank you isa um we started the work on this next generation report actually we decided that we will do a next generation report after 13 years last february so it's been a year of uh, research looking at the challenges that came our way uh, the situation of floods particularly um despite all of that i would like to very graciously thank you our partners um ipsos and their team babar saab abdullah usman zaira key people who drew who drove the research work made it possible because they were the real um stars out in the field collecting data analyzing it and working with us day and night um british council staff across pakistan as well as in the uk who provided technical support our task force the most um uh, eminent group of practitioners we could find the very diverse group of people from different walks of life academia media um uh, civil society um uh, the government itself and we felt that the task force contributions were not just to take off for the british council or the researchers were researchers were saying part of their role as to advise and really challenge us and look at how these findings need to be interpreted and to be taken forward um as a as a result from this report 
um, was all due to the re uh, task force members. Some of them are not present here in person, but have sent their best wishes and interest to work with the British Council in taking these recommendations and meaningful actions ahead. Last but not the least, the 3,600 plus young people, thank you very, very much for making this possible today. Um, we couldn't have done this without you taking that active participation, that candid reflection that you shared in the questionnaire, in the focus group discussions, in the opinion polls. Um, the 23 report is not going to be our last report in the next generation. We hope that th this report enables programming which, uh, which responds directly to the reflections that young people have asked and referred to in the report. Um, with this, the next generation, um, the caravan is now going to Bangladesh next year, same time this time. Uh, we will be doing the Bangladesh report, but this is an exciting time for Pakistan next report, uh, Pakistan's report because it directly links with British Council, Pakistan's youth program. Um, the previous program, Active Citizens, um, a decade-long program has done its wonders and um, is really embedded in the work of so many partners and organizations, universities and colleges. The new program is going to build upon that legacy and take it forward and also look at the policy aspect where young people can not only make make more difference in the communities but in the decision making platforms as well. Thank you very much to all audience who have joined us today, who have celebrated the launch. We look forward to you looking at the report available on BritishCouncil.pk website. Have a look. If you have feedback, comments, please write to us at the given email address. And if you want to connect back, please contact the team and share how you want to collaborate on the findings. Thank you very much. Um, I hand over back to Isam. Sadia. Um, and with that, we come to a close for today. Thank you so much to all of you for being an excellent audience. Um, as we bring this event to a close, I'd like you all to, I'd like to invite you all to join us for dinner. Um, there are a number of ushers in the back who will guide you to where it is. Right outside the door in the back is where lunch is being served. Um, please do join us and uh, feel free to walk up to any one of us if you have any questions. Once again, thank you so much and a huge round of applause for all of you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. <laughs>